If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 76, Marvel Somewhere in New York, an unassuming yet stylishly dressed elderly man in glasses looked up towards Stark Tower. Hmm. Why? How can the descendant of that guy be so weak, and what is he doing here? Well, never mind, it adds some fun to it. Besides, this family will owe me. Hey, you there. No need to gawk at the lad, you perverts. He waved his hand, and many beings in the world seemed to lose sight of the territory where Asmodeus and his group were. The first thing Asmodeus heard in this new world was. Ding, traversing spatial temporal membrane. Ding, evaluating temporal ratios. Ding, aligning temporal messaging advantageous for the host. Ding, time ratio with the original world, 1 colon 3, 3 hours in the new world equals 1 hour in the original world. Ding, attempts to track the host by entities with combat power below 500 blocked. Block 327 entities. Note. Eavesdropping is blocked only from beings, not from technologies. Would you like to purchase a ticket for an urgent transition to the original world? Asmodeus hadn't even opened his eyes to explore the new world, yet he found himself exclaiming under his breath, Yes, damn it. Quickly buy a ticket back. Activate it immediately in case of critical danger. Ding, purchase complete. Remaining balance 93,245 points. Thank you for using the system. When the system notification ended, Asmodeus felt weightless. He was falling from the sky. Subconsciously reacting, Asmodeus attempted to fly towards the nearest building. However, he sensed danger from the left and veered to the right, altering his flight trajectory. Boom! A blue energy beam passed by him. Without looking back, Asmodeus sent a wave of fiend fire backward and accelerated to reach solid ground. Landing on some skyscraper to the right of the beam shooting upwards, he finally had a moment to survey his surroundings. A modern city, warfare, strange beings flying in the sky half robots, half bugs. Hold on, half robots, half bugs. Asmodeus sharply turned to look at the portal in the sky he fell from and then at the source of the beam. What the hell? Is this darn Marvel Universe? I need to find those old folks and get out of here. There are too many entities with combat power exceeding 500 in this universe. Who knows if some god won't come after me? Well, not in DC, and I'm thankful for that. If I ended up there. No, forget it, too dangerous a universe. They shouldn't have gone far in such a short time. I'll have to look near the portal. Having concluded his internal dilemma, Asmodeus rushed toward the portal. Fire emanated from his hands and feet, tightly compressed, while air magic assisted him in controlling his flight. He refrained from elementalizing as he had no intention of engaging with anyone dangerous, and Mana needed to be conserved. As soon as he arrived in this world, he sensed that Mana in this space was peculiar. If in the world of Harry Potter, Mana was of a neutral element, easily controlled and pliable, then in this world, despite its higher density, Mana seemed like a mixture of various elements. Unlike the Avatar world where these elements were distinct, here, it was like a heap of dirt pretending to be Mana in the air. Though usable, it was much harder to control. While Asmodeus flew, he also queried the system, hey, what's the mana density on this planet? I feel it's definitely higher than in our world, but the mana is dirty. And why does electricity work? Ding, mana density is 15. As for electricity, it's because mana in the world of Harry Potter has no element, whereas here, each energy has its own element. In simple terms, mana in the world of Harry Potter can become any type of energy, occupying the entire spatial range. In the Marvel world, mana comes from different dimensions, and these dimensions exist on different levels of space. This type of mana doesn't affect other forms of energy and can coexist with electricity. In short, the world of Harry Potter is designed around magic, while in the Marvel world, magic is just one source of power and not a popular one. Clearly, nothing is clear. Well, not that important. Answer me. Can I absorb this mana if needed? Ding, yes. But the system does not recommend it, unknown energies without prior analysis may affect spell outcomes. So, what the should I do? Ding, clearance sale. Small mana potion, 1000 points. One vial replenishes 5000 points of user mana. Medium mana potion, 3000 points. One vial replenishes 15000 points of mana. Large mana potion, 
7,500 points. One vial replenishes 50,000 points of mana. It is recommended to consume in small sips, otherwise, mana oversaturation may occur, harmful to organic beings. Are you trying to fleece me in this situation? Give me four large potions and five small ones. Ding, purchased items added to the system storage. Deducted, 41,500. Remaining balance, 51,845 points. I've been saving these points for so long. Asmodeus lamented to himself. While Asmodeus flew across the battlefield in search of the old folks, someone noticed him. Dash. Uh, Stark, did you make another autopilot suit? Guys, I'm not in the mood for jokes right now. I've got a bunch of cyberbugs crawling out of the portal. Sir, Captain may be referring to that. Before Stark's eyes, an image appeared of Asmodeus flying around Stark Tower as if searching for something. Hey, Fury, is this your guy? No, first time seeing him. We didn't even realize it was a person at first. The flight is too much like yours. I'm definitely faster. Anyway, I don't care where he's from, the main thing is that he's on our side. Try to contact him somehow, I'm busy. By the way, where are you headed? Three hours in, heading east. Did you guys stop for a snack? Turn towards the park, I'll lead them to you. Dash. Damn it, where are those old idiots? And these bugs are getting on my nerves. Hurry up and die. With a shout, Asmodeus flipped over and directed his hands towards the pursuing Chitori squad. Burn, you bastards. The flames unleashed by Asmodeus this time were not ordinary but an enhanced version of Grindelwald's fiend fire. In an instant, a wave of black and red fire appeared on one of the streets in New York, devouring everything in its path. The Chitmori literally disappeared upon touching Asmodeus's fire, as did buildings and vehicles in the vicinity. Perhaps even some unsuspecting civilians whom Asmodeus didn't notice. Dash. Thor, what's happening up there? The power protecting the cube is insurmountable. Thor's right. We need to deal with these guys first. How do we do that? With a coordinated attack. I haven't finished asking Loki everything. Yet? Get in line. Not now, Loki will turn all steel against us. Without him, these creatures will start a massacre. Stark is working from above, but we need to. The sound of a motorcycle engine. Well, what? Somehow it's all eerie. I've seen worse. Sorry. No, we could use that kind of horror. Stark? He's with us. Bruce. As you said. Then get ready. You're in for a party. Stark zoomed around the corner, followed by a massive Chitori space turtle, the Leviathan. And he calls this a party. Seeing this, Banner gradually moved towards the Chitori. Dr. Banner, it's time to get angry now. That's my secret, Captain. I'm always angry. With each step, Dr. Banner grew larger and greener. Roar. The Hulk ran towards the Chitori. Swing. Smash. Scale after scale, the ship's armor disintegrated, but a new danger loomed over the team, the Leviathan's torso was falling towards them. Hold on. But before Tony could do anything, the top of the Leviathan was engulfed in black flames. In just a few seconds, the Leviathan turned to ashes. Roar. Hulk stepped back cautiously, surveying the fire that still burned in some places. Don't growl at me, I'm really angry right now. A clearly annoyed voice emerged from the flames. Chapter 77, Avengers Step by step, Asmodeus emerged from the flames. While all the Avengers were battered and bruised, Asmodeus looked dazzling as always, without a single wrinkle on his beloved official attire of the Fire Nation. He had put it on when he and Rovina were planning to take a stroll. Apologies for interrupting your heroics, but have you happened to see three old men, though they don't look particularly old right now? All right. Let me rephrase. Have you seen three men? One around 45 to 50 with a long thick beard, possibly tied in a bow, who can also transform into a phoenix. The second one, silver-haired, quite handsome. Sometimes a third eye appears on his forehead. And the last one, in these circumstances, a four-armed bald guy with blue stripes on his body and brightly glowing eyes. Avengers. Jarvis, find the ones this guy is talking about. Sir. There are matches. Two of them are literally three blocks north of here. The last one will arrive here in three, two, one. 
Asmodeus, ah, I brought a directional pointer with me for a reason. By the way, I know where these two fools are, but with the level of these beings, they won't even touch a hair on their heads. Nothing to worry about, we can have some fun. Before the Avengers stood a peculiar figure. Four arms, two of them clearly metallic with strange runes inscribed on them. A bald head with blue glowing stripes running across the entire body and brightly shining eyes. If it weren't for the fact that this creature spoke in a human language, they would have attacked immediately. Nicholas, you old scoundrel. Did you decide to die in your old age? Jumping into a portal head first without knowing the destination. Mark my words, I'll tell Pernell about your actions, I swear it won't go well for you. No, please. I just wanted to retrieve Albus and Grindelwald. Why are you so harsh with me? And why run through worlds for 666 years? Avengers, except Thor, did he just say 666 years? So, are we going to get Albus and Grindelwald and go home? I have a way. Already? Maybe we'll have a bit more fun? You know, my bones haven't had such a good warm-up in a long time. Besides, Albus will probably want to help those muggles running around. Hmm. I don't want to linger in this world for long. It's more dangerous than it seems. Much more dangerous. Oh? Does your prophecy work? You know, my prophecies don't work here at all, as if someone doesn't let them take effect. Perhaps only Grindelwald can see the future in this world, but you know, he can't see far in ordinary circumstances. Cough, cough, yes, yes, prophecies. He can't reveal that he has seen the plot of this world and even read certain comics. At that moment, Tony intervened in the conversation, already firing at the approaching Chitori. Um, sorry to interrupt, but we're kind of in the middle of a battle, and you're here having a chat. Would you like to help? Nicholas, take this potion, it replenishes mana. Can you handle them? Ha ha ha. With pleasure. Blue spears of condensed mana formed in Nicholas's hands. When they became dense enough, he threw them forward, exploding and destroying several Chitori at once. In his current state, he was agile and physically strong, so the old man decided to rush ahead to the front lines. From a distance, Asmodeus thought he looked like an aggressive green Martian from the movie John Carter. Just as the others were ready to begin the attack, they saw a red bird carrying a middle-aged man in its claws. They immediately understood that this was the person the strange guy calling himself a wizard had mentioned. As Dumbledore flew past Asmodeus, he dropped Grindelwald and headed towards Nicholas. Transforming, he began attacking all nearby Chitori with various spells. Dumbledore enjoyed the classical style of magical duels, unlike Asmodeus, aggressive and focused on explosive destructive force, Dumbledore's style was refined and deadly. Seeing Grindelwald in front of him, Asmodeus asked, What the hell were you doing on the tower just when the portal opened? Hey, don't ask me. It was Albus who went in after I boasted that the amplifier in Nurmengard would work four days a week, not three like yours. Will this be two? Never mind why I'm even concerned about this now. As I understand it, Albus wanted you to pass something to me, since he didn't bother to stop himself. Yes, we noticed you flying by. Albus knew you'd quickly take him back, but he wants to help these muggles. Merlin's dirty underwear. Why do you all enjoy being in an unknown world and fighting weak opponents? It would be better to arrange a duel between you and Albus, who knows, maybe you'll get revenge this time. Hmm, you. I propose a wager, if I destroy more of these strange bugs than you, then you'll tell me what happened with Rovina yesterday evening. Everyone saw you leaving together. Hmm, everything happened, I have no reason to hide it. But why do you want to know? I thought you, well, you know. Who told you that? I play on both fronts. I'm not going to lose half the fun. Just don't tell Albus. But congratulations on Rovina, she suits you. Um, I probably have enough of half the fun, but thanks. As Asmodeus was about to say something else, Natasha approached them. I don't know if you're planning to help us or not, but your friends are already there. So here are two communicators, insert them into your ears, and you'll be able to talk at a distance. Thank you. Well. Since Albus and Nicholas are having fun, why don't we relax a bit too? All right, convinced. With these words, Asmodeus began to change form. From head to toe, he gradually transformed into a fire elemental. Since the enemies aren't strong but numerous, 
Asmodeus decided to enter a state where he could unleash his fire magic to the fullest. Grindelwald elegantly drew his wand hidden in his sleeve and, activating his third eye, began to conduct the attack like a conductor orchestrating his fiend fire. Meanwhile, Tony, flying through the city and fending off Chitori with melancholy, observed the relaxed wizards. Darn it, why are we struggling while they casually kill these creatures? And why the heck did that guy completely transform into fire? It's called elementalization, sir. Jarvis, I know what it's called, but how does it work? At that moment, Steve joined the channel. It's easy for you to say, you're flying. Natasha, Barton, and I can only watch as these four teleport from one place to another. All right, that's not important now. How are you doing? Have you figured out how to close the portal? Yes, Skipper Loki left a mark. Steve will pick it up, and we'll be ready to close the portal. At that moment, Fury called Tony urgently. Stark, the Security Council launched a nuclear missile on the city against my decision. After ending the call with Nick, Tony quickly said to Natasha. Don't close the portal. They've launched a nuke at us, and I know where to divert it. At that moment, Asmodeus's voice echoed. Before elementalizing, he had placed a transmitter in the storage system, but now, with no Chitori around him and tired of just burning weaklings, he inserted the transmitter back into his ear. Oh, a nuclear missile? Lead it to us. Natasha, you can close the portal, don't worry. What? What? I don't know how it works for you wizards, but for us regular folks, if a nuclear missile is coming at us, the first reaction is to get away from it. No, no. Guys, don't you understand that the so-called Security Council just wants to get rid of you after seeing your abilities, and us too, by the way. So, I decided to give them a surprise. Hey, Gellert, can you hear me? Yes. Summon Albus and give him the transmitter. Albus here. Albus, Tony will bring a nuclear missile to you. Use transfiguration to turn it into whatever you want. Just make sure it returns to its original state after three minutes. Understood, but what do you want to do with it? Leave a little gift for the snakes. Guys, you're insane. If we all die because of you. Don't worry, Albus is the best in transfiguration, he won't make a mistake. You all talk as if we understand anything about your so-called magic. Okay, but what does it mean to leave a little gift? Do you know the coordinates of the main office of the Security Council? Well, yes. It's... Perfect. Lead the missile to Albus, Dumbledore. I'll be with you in a minute. The missile should be ready by then. All right. Tony picked up the missile and guided it towards Dumbledore. Fury, who saw this on the screen, shouted at the top of his lungs, Damn, what are you doing? It's a nuclear missile. As the missile flew towards Dumbledore, Tony, releasing the missile, quickly flew upward, just in case. But fortunately, nothing terrible happened. Under the transfiguration magic of Albus, the missile turned into a rabbit. Tony couldn't believe his eyes. Hey, am I the only one seeing this? Sir, I can confirm that I also saw the warhead transform into a rabbit. Just as Dumbledore finished his part, Asmodeus appeared nearby. I'll take it from here. Boom. Asmodeus operat to the coordinates provided by Tony. He appeared on the roof of the Security Council building in Washington, where Alexander Pierce currently was. After a couple more apparitions, Asmodeus found himself on the very bottom level of the building, deep underground. This way, the collateral damage would be limited to a couple of blocks rather than the entire city. After patting the rabbit, Asmodeus returned to the battlefield. At that moment, the portal closed, and with the loss of connection to the Chitori mothership, they went offline. Though the mothership remained intact this time, it was still hundreds of light years away from Earth, and no signal would reach it. However, Asmodeus had already dealt with the local threats for the future Avengers. One. Two. Three. Boom. An explosion echoed in Washington. The building filled with Hydra agents and several members of the Security Council who supported the plan to kill millions of innocent citizens was wiped off the face of the Earth forever. A few seconds later, Fury called Tony again. What the hell did the fiery guy do? Hey. The headquarters of the Security Council and the surrounding blocks were destroyed by a huge explosion. Uh, Asmodeus, that's your name, right? Did you relocate a nuclear bomb to the address I gave you? Yes. But there were thousands of innocent people there. 
you forgot that the Security Council was thinking about a plan that would result in the deaths of millions of innocent citizens when they sent the missile. Let it serve as a reminder for them. By the way, you'll thank me later, I took care of most of the Hydra agents in the Security Council. You're welcome. Steve chimed in at this point. Hydra? They disappeared a long time ago. You're just insane, blowing up an entire block with a nuclear bomb. I'll explain later, and you'll understand. What's there to understand? You killed thousands of people. Nevertheless, Tony decided to defend Asmodeus. He didn't know why, but it seemed to him that Asmodeus knew something crucial. Let's calm down, guys. Meet me at Stark Tower, my suit is almost out of energy. Fine, but if this wizard doesn't explain why he's so... Asmodeus didn't bother listening further. He removed the earpiece and flew to Stark Tower. Asmodeus and Dumbledore were flying towards the tower, while Nicholas and Grindelwald operated to the meeting point. Grindelwald didn't conceal his third eye, but Nicholas decided to end his transformation. Tony and Hulk watched with interest as the four-armed monster gradually turned into a 60-year-old man. Hulk, brother. The Avengers. At that moment, Asmodeus and Dumbledore descended from above in their phoenix forms. Seeing that everything was finally assembled and they could talk calmly, Tony asked, Well, who are you, and where did you come from? Asmodeus wanted to answer, but Dumbledore, who had already transformed into his human form, interrupted him. Adjusting his beard, he began to introduce himself. Oh, excuse us for not introducing ourselves earlier. I am Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, the headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and a member of the Wizarding Council holding the position of deputy chair. This three-eyed aggressive man is Gellert Grindelwald, the headmaster of Nurmengard Academy, also a member of the Wizarding Council, responsible for overseeing law enforcement. This elderly man is my good friend, Nicholas Flamel, an alchemist and an honorary principal of the Charmbatten School of Magic, a member of the Wizarding Council responsible for developing new methods of applying alchemy. And the one you call the fiery guy is Asmodeus the chairman of the Wizarding Council and the owner of the Elysium Academy for Research and Education in Magic. Okay, let's assume all these things are true. But why did you say Hydra was planning to get rid of us, and how is the Security Council involved in this? Just as Tony was about to inquire why Asmodeus claimed that the Security Council intended to kill them, they were interrupted by sparks gradually appearing in the air, forming a ring. Witnessing the unfolding events, Asmodeus encircled the three elderly men and was about to use a teleportation ticket when he heard. Mr. Morningstar, I've come to you not for a battle but rather to discuss magic and exchange experiences. Emerging from the portal was a bald woman, ancient, supreme sorceress of the earth. The one Asmodeus was most concerned about, even though she sided with good and wouldn't attack Asmodeus without cause. But there was a cause, he was from another universe, first of all, and secondly, he may have disrupted the future she had carefully planned. Um. Can you appear here in their presence at this time? Won't it disrupt the sacred timeline? Oh, you even know about our universe? It's fascinating how well your gift of prophecy extends. Ancient one, I know much, but right now, I'm concerned about whether you consider me your enemy. You are the guardian of time on Earth, and we altered events. Mr. Morningstar, you need not worry. Firstly, it's not your fault that you ended up in our universe. Secondly, the moment you entered this universe, I sensed the liberation from the shackles of those attempting to control time. Thirdly, the path chosen under previous circumstances is not necessarily the best. So, would you care for a cup of tea with me? Asmodeus, let's go. She doesn't seem hostile, and besides, she's clearly a witch of this dimension. Maybe we can exchange experiences. Dumbledore was clearly intrigued by the friendly nun offering him tea. Do you have honey for the tea? Yes, of course. Okay, fine. But firstly, she's a mage, not a witch, and secondly, even if I hadn't agreed, it would be too difficult to leave her with all of you on our tail, so we'll have to go. Mr. Morningstar, you speak as if I'm some kind of monster. Upon hearing Asmodeus's words, the Ancient One opened her fan and gently waved it. Well, in a sense, except for Thor and Nicholas, everyone here is younger than you, at least by a couple of centuries. Oh, didn't you know you're not supposed to mention a woman's age? The Ancient One's eyes dangerously gleamed after Asmodeus's words. Hmm, sorry. Once all the wizards passed through the portal, and the Avengers thought this group would leave without answers, the Ancient One looked at Tony. 
Are you coming? The Avengers were clearly surprised by such a question. Us. Well, the Avengers. Yes, yes, of course. Chapter 78, Reflections on Magic with the Ancient In the Grand Hall of Kamartaj, the main building and reception area, Avengers sat on cushions arranged in a semicircle on the floor. The group of Asmodeus conjured chairs and armchairs for themselves, while Asmodeus even enchanted an airborne scooter and lazily rolled back and forth. Only Loki, bound in chains, lay on the floor squirming. Mr. Dumbledore, how much honey do you prefer in your tea? Oh, if you don't mind, two spoons. I have a sweet tooth. No problem at all. Though we may not live luxuriously, we're not so poor that we can't afford honey. Haha, <laughs> well said. After Ancient finished distributing tea, Tony decided that if he didn't ask his questions now, they wouldn't understand a word in the future conversation. Um, excuse me, Ancient, you. Oh, Mr. Stark, pardon my interruption. But first, let's hear the opinions of our guests. Friends from distant worlds, would you mind if I address the fundamental questions of our reality defenders first? Well, since we're here, why not? I still hope to negotiate a book exchange on magic with you. It seems we'll have to stay here for a while. Asmodeus replied, lazily swaying on his airborne scooter. Excellent. Mr. Stark, feel free to ask. I'll address any doubts you may have. Um, well then. Where are we? Neither my companions nor even my suit can determine our location. We are in Kamartaj, in Kathmandu. Kamartaj is the home, training grounds, and the main headquarters of the Masters of the Mystic Arts, or as we are also called, Wizards. It also serves as a sanctuary for those who come here after being broken or damaged, physically and psychologically. Once they are healed, they can choose to join the Masters of the Mystic Arts or return to their previous lives. So, what did Asmodeus mean when he said you defend the Earth? While you Avengers defend people from themselves and the consequences of their actions, we defend the Earth from hostile dimensions far more terrifying than anything you can imagine. Are they also from hostile dimensions? Tony pointed at Asmodeus, who was reheating his cooled tea with fire. They are not from a dimension, they came from another universe as a result of an attempt to control one of the Infinity Stones. So, we summoned them. What did you expect? Trying to control power that even Asgard struggled with at its peak, Nick Fury's actions sent a signal to the universe. Earth is ready for cosmic war. As for our visitors from another universe. I'll continue if you let me. Asmodeus realized that the Ancient was curious about how the Space Stone managed to break through into another multiverse. Well, actually, in our universe, or more precisely, on the planet, there was a change in the energy structure. On an Earth scale, it took quite a while, but in the universe, it was just a moment. As I understand it, small spatial rifts formed in the process, and we artificially increased mana density in certain places, which made it easier to tear the spatial fabric. Though it was an instant event, it turned out that those two old men were exactly where the portal opened, so Nicholas and I had no choice but to chase after them. Who knows which universe they ended up in? Asmodeus shrugged in response. Oh, you artificially increased the density of natural energy in space? Interesting. But it seems magic in our worlds differs. Am I right, Mr. Morningstar? Well, we rely on mana produced by our world only partially. Most of the time, our bodies generate mana themselves. By the way, Tony, if you're not sure which universe you'll end up in, better not travel. I'm not sure how this thing in your heart works, but with mana density in our world. In short, we don't have electricity in our world. So you should be careful if one day you are going to be traveling to other universes. What? The Avengers were shocked unable to fathom the world these strange folks lived in. Upon hearing Asmodeus's words, the ancient contemplated, hmm, mana density, we don't have such an issue. Even in places with a high concentration of magicians. I think it's due to the difference in energy composition. As I understand it, the magic we use is slightly different, right? Well, to confirm that, I would like to hear from you how your sorcerers determine and differentiate magic. In our world, Magic is divided into three categories, personal energies, universal energies, and dimensional energies. All magic is built on the idea that all realities can be altered using the existing power, whether it's within ourselves, in the universe, or in other dimensions. The ancient spoke and gestured for Asmodeus to share the differences. 
Our universe is similar in this regard, but wizards in our world traditionally rely on lineage. At least that was the case before. Magical blood allows the use of magic, but we've circumvented this limitation using runes. For people without a natural talent for magic, we engrave runes directly into the heart. Over time, the runes merge with the body, turning previously ordinary blood into magical. As for universal energies, that's what we call mana. It's everywhere in our world, though the overall density of mana can't compare to your world, it's pure and more malleable, in a way. But such purity also blocks electricity and most modern conveniences. Although magic can replace all of that. Upon hearing Asmodeus, the ancient continued the explanation, in our world, personal energies are those derived from the life force of a sorcerer. Personal energy can only be used to enhance abilities developed through mental exploration, thus limited to mental abilities such as astral projection, hypnosis, telekinesis, and telepathy. However, as continuous use of such energies is known to fatally deplete a person by absorbing their life force, mages must also learn to harness external forces through meditation techniques and willpower training. For instance, those trained in Kunlun learn to use an internal force known as Qi as a means to strengthen their own mind and willpower, as well as various physical abilities to varying degrees. In our world, thanks to lineage, we wizards don't undergo such trials, and there's no need to strengthen ourselves. Actually, children as young as three years old can use magic, albeit clumsily, if they are natural wizards, of course. As long as there's still mana reserve, and it's sufficient, you can use spells and do whatever you want, replied Asmodeus. The ancient nodded, no longer paying attention to whether the Avengers understood anything, and continued speaking. Now let's move on to universal energies. In our world, one of the simplest sources from which a mage can draw strength is the universal energies of their home dimension. Universal energies can be used for summoning, transmutation, and teleportation. They are often employed in combat to create shields, weapons, and other constructs made of energy. Universal spells usually require specific gestures and slash or words for activation. Some universal energies can also be utilized by astral bodies containing a spatial anchor in the form of an artifact or a person. Asmodeus nodded and began to respond, there isn't much difference here, except in our world, external energies are controlled unconsciously. Only great and experienced wizards can consciously gather mana from the environment to enhance spells. Additionally, it's important to note that if we cast a spell without intentional external mana reinforcement, our own mana constitutes 75-80% to of the cost of the spell. Though, as I mentioned, powerful wizards can manipulate ambient mana almost as they wish. So in our world, at our level, it's rare for a mage to lack mana for a spell. More likely, they'll just mentally or physically tire. Interesting, interesting. Since that's the case, I'll summarize the topic of energies. Dimensional energies are those drawn from other planes of existence throughout the multiverse or bestowed upon a sorcerer by one or more extra-dimensional entities. These entities must be entreated by the sorcerer, s, through ritual spells and, possibly, through promises, contracts, or some form of sacrifice. In short, gods or demons give you power in exchange for something. This is where the biggest difference between our magic disciplines begins. Most sorcerers, especially those using extra-dimensional energies like the masters of mystic arts, learn the art of spell casting which conceptually resembles programming and coding in computer sciences and is used to create various effects. Exactly, just like scientific formulas and mathematical equations, achieving certain phenomena may require specific words, gestures, or rituals of one kind or another, while others may involve the use of relics and other objects endowed with supernatural power. Moreover, these effects can be accompanied by the appearance of the most intricate and complex geometric configurations and patterns, whether in the form of projected energy constructs or inscribed onto a physical surface, object, or location. As magic is practiced in different cultures and pertains to various disciplines, these formations can serve as symbols most closely associated with its practitioners. A vivid example of this phenomenon is the emergence of mandalas, spiritual symbols usually linked to earthly religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, in the magic practiced by us sorcerers of Kamartaj. Your wizards seem more like a blend of our sorcerers and Asgardian sorcerers who rely solely on concentration and movement to harness their abilities. Am I correct? Yes, you are indeed a distinguished master of mystic arts, ancient. What you referred to as concentration and movements, we call silent casting when a wizard doesn't utter an incantation but utilizes magic. As you mentioned, it requires concentration and strong will. Chapter 79, Odin 
Once again, your wizards remind me a lot of Asgardians," said the Ancient One. Well, the blood of ancient gods runs in Asgardians. Asmodeus couldn't start before being interrupted by the Ancient One. No need. I fear Odin will come to me to sort out why we revealed the secrets of his family in such a diverse circle. Upon hearing his father's name, Thor asked in surprise. You're familiar with my father. Why has he never told me that there are sorcerers on Earth? Before the Ancient One could answer, Asmodeus said. Well, in a sense, they are very ancient acquaintances. Thor, what do you know about Asgard's past? How did Asgard become one of the untouchable realms in this universe? Do you think wars like the ones you fought truly matter? I. Thor pondered Asmodeus's words. Unfortunately, he rarely visited the Asgardian library and knew little about the intricacies of Asgardian history. While Thor contemplated the history of Asgard's conquest, the Avengers tried to comprehend what Asmodeus had said about Asgard being one of the untouchable realms. Tony and Steve couldn't fathom that Asgard held such a high position in the universe. Mr. Morningstar, enough teasing my guests. All right, all right. Thor, I'll put it this way. Your father, at the peak of his power, was one of the strongest beings in the universe. He even battled creatures responsible for maintaining the balance in the multiverse and defeated several of them. Here, the Ancient One joined in. As for my acquaintance with him. After the battle Mr. Morningstar speaks of, your father was severely wounded, wounds that still haven't healed, undermining his further path. When the sorcerers on Earth realized that Asgard couldn't reclaim its lands, we attempted to free the Earth from Asgard's influence. But Odin wasn't willing to relinquish the Earth, he fought those creatures precisely because of the Earth. So, on the battlefield, Odin and I met. Even when Odin was weak, I was in a losing position but could fend off. When the war was about to reach an impasse, Odin and I agreed that Asgard would retain the right to be called the owner of the Earth but would not interfere in Earth's internal affairs. However, it also meant that Earth's defense would weaken, so we divided responsibilities. We handle external dimensions, while Odin and Asgard protect the Earth from others in our universe. Um, so the universe considers us one of Asgard's colonies. In a sense. At least until Nick Fury launched the cube. At this moment, Dr. Banner, who had regained his composure long ago, asked, but if we are under Asgard's protection, and one of their own started a war, why didn't Odin send an army for support? Asgard is weakened. What do you mean? Calm down, Thor. Tony restrained Thor, who wanted to stand up and confront Asmodeus. He clearly understood that, based on Asmodeus's previous words, Odin had not fully healed from that injury. Thor, don't be offended, but Asgard now and Asgard 2000 years ago, they are simply beings from different worlds. It's as if gods became mortal. Not to mention Asgard 4000 years ago when Odin wasn't wounded. In those years, as I mentioned, he was one of the strongest, and incidentally was one of the most dangerous beings in the universe. And now? What about my father now? Thor asked, now calmer. Seeing that Asmodeus didn't want to upset Thor, the Ancient One tried to change the subject, but then an old voice was heard. Cough, cough. Son, I am old. More precisely, my body can no longer contain the amount of energy present in me. Thor turned sharply and saw an old man with a spear in hand and a missing eye. Father. Hello, my sons. Odin embraced Thor and glanced at Loki. Loki. Loki turned away from Odin. Sigh. Greetings, Odin. And greetings to you. Long time no see. Yes. You also don't seem to be in the best condition, from what I can see. Not for you to tell. But yes, you're right. I only came because someone is revealing my dark story, otherwise, I'd prefer to be asleep. My condition is better than yours. Oh, what difference does it make now? You're just as much an old hag at the end of the road as I am. What? At this moment, everyone present, except Asmodeus, stood up from their seats. It was clear from the conversation that both Odin and the Ancient One were not far from death, and this was not the best prospect for Earth. Especially the Avengers who now had no intention of losing either of these giants who protect their world. Um, Mr., Your Majesty, King Odin. You. Haha, <laughs> just call me Odin. I'm not that petty. And yes, I am dying. Within ten years, a year sooner or later, but I will die. In theory, as Earthlings like to say, 
the royal family of Asgard is immortal. But that's only if the body's growth and energy growth correspond to each other. My body was injured and is weak even compared to my father. But in terms of energy, there's so much of it that if I wanted, with the last blow in my life, I could easily take a planet with me. Due to such enormous accumulations, my body can no longer endure. Additionally, Hela is trying to break free from her imprisonment every day. Hela. Your sister, my firstborn. We have a sister. This time, both Thor and even Loki shouted at the top of their lungs. Quiet. The Ancient One hit both of these noisy individuals on the head with her fan. Sorry. Father, why didn't you tell us about our sister? And why is she imprisoned? Seeing that Odin didn't want to talk about Hela, as Modius said, Your Majesty, we may have a solution to your problems. Ha, huh, kid, you may be strong, but at my level, what can save you won't have an effect. What if I'm not talking about complete salvation, just about extending life? Besides, who knows what you might find in our universe? Well, what is it? Nicholas, how much elixir did you bring with you? Hey? Oh, I didn't even think about that. But don't worry, ha ha ha, I thought we might get stuck here for a couple of years, so besides five tons of elixir, I brought one hundred stones with me. So don't worry. But are you sure it will help? I think we can give him a few more decades. You know, the elixir helps attach the soul to the body and in your case, it works, so why wouldn't it work in larger doses? Hmm. What do you think about our runes? But that's extra energy. But it's softer, you've noticed, right? His energy is similar to mana, but it's very aggressive and regularly grows. Um, could you explain a bit about what you're talking about? We don't understand a thing. Tony asked, as he could no longer stand magical discussions. Odin and the Ancient One nodded as well. No one wants to die if there's a possibility to save themselves. And if saving Odin is possible, then saving the Ancient One is also on the table. The Ancient One's problem is not that she'll be killed by her own student in the future. No, her main concern is that the energy of the Dark Dimension will gradually consume her. That's why, in five years, she'll decide to let herself be killed to avoid turning into another enemy. Oops, sorry. We sometimes get carried away. Yes. Too bad you didn't forget to come when I was in Paris. Grindelwald, believe it or not, but I'll return the mana amplifier to your academy and rearrange things at Hogwarts. If you recall how you tried to burn Paris, that won't earn you any points. Hey? The Avengers? Ancient One. Cough, cough. All right, guys, enough. Nicholas, tell us what you and Asmodeus suggest for Odin. Well, first, I need to explain more about myself. My name is Nicholas Flamel. An alchemist and, incidentally, immortal. The Avengers members witnessed such a unique self-presentation for the first time. You haven't achieved true immortality. But in your state, with regular replenishment of life energy, you'll live another thousand years without problems. Odin inspected Nicholas and said. In response Nicholas told. Well, yes. But I'm already 666 years old, and I'm just a human. The thing is, I created the Philosopher's Stone, the pinnacle of alchemy. It allows me to create the elixir of life that fills my body and soul with life energy. But the most important thing is that this liquid forcibly binds the soul to the body. So even if the body is in a state of decay, I can remain in human form, and I won't have to become a ghost. Hearing about ghosts, Tony couldn't contain himself and bombarded Nicholas with a barrage of questions. In your world, are there ghosts? I mean, does the soul exist? Where do the dead go after death in your world? How to make the Philosopher's Stone? Why can you transform into a four-armed creature? Can we first solve more pressing issues? Forgive me, I just can't contain myself anymore. For the first time in my life, I understand absolutely nothing. Cough, cough. So, do you think this elixir can extend my life? In conjunction with our runes and our mana, yes. But for that, you'll have to go to our universe for some time. You must absorb enough mana to help contain your intense divine energy. And what if there's an imbalance? I mean, what if there isn't enough mana to neutralize the influence of my own energy? Then. We haven't thought that far yet. Chapter 80, Wizards Conversations Do you know this doesn't sound very convincing? Well, yes. As for you, Ancient One. 
I know your problem, and its solution is much simpler. Drink a couple of hundred elixirs, sever the connection with that dimension. I'm also willing to exchange runes so you can generate mana independently, using magic without depleting life energy. I agree. I'm willing to try as well. But what do we need to pay? Kamartaj will exchange all types of magic with us, not requiring energy from other dimensions. In return, Nicholas and I will provide enough elixirs and mana to solve the ancient problem. As for Asgard. If all goes well, I want a complete copy of all Asgard's books. Upon hearing Asmodeus' words, Odin approached, extending his hand. Deal. Deal. The Ancient One didn't lag behind, she immediately opened a portal to the library. Master Jan, please sort all books on magic and make copies. Wait, wait. Hey? You're not. No, no, Ancient One. Pass this to Master January. Nicholas said, pulling three enchanted feathers from his pocket. These are enchanted feathers, the red one writes what you dictate, the black one can copy books, and the white one corrects spelling mistakes. The librarian, who spent half his life copying basic knowledge. Ancient one, ahem, thank you. I always thought our masters would like this tool. Odin, do you happen to have another one that writes by dictation? You know, I get so tired of signing documents in Asgard. Everyone. Ahem, ahem. Forget it. No, no. Take it, you just reminded me of someone. Nicholas said, glancing at Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Ahem. Okay, let's get started. Asmodeus, do you have supplies of dragon's blood? While the Ancient One drinks the elixir, I want to prepare as much as I can for Odin. But I don't have a lot of dragon blood with me. How much did you bring with you? Oh, just about a couple of dozen tons. Not enough. The Avengers, dragons? A couple of dozen tons of dragon blood? Did you decimate the dragon population? Well, I have a couple of more liters of Athena's blood. You know, Rowena wants to check the compatibility of Athena's blood with other dragons. Sigh, we should have built more dragon farms. Why didn't we think of that? The Avengers? This time, not only the Avengers but even Odin and the Ancient One pondered. Dragon farms? What kind of world do they have? Seeing that everyone, except Dumbledore and Grindelwald, was surprised this time, Tony decided to ask. Um, guys. Dragons, is it what I'm thinking? Well, a big lizard with wings that breathes fire. If that's what you're thinking, then yes. So in your world, they breed them on farms. That's obvious. How else do we get materials for potions and alchemy? We can't just barge into a dragon sanctuary every time we need something. Besides, hunting them is quite a bothersome task. If you come across a Welsh green, that's fine, but Hungarian horntail, those are some aggressive creatures. You won't even get close before they shower you with spikes and flames. By the way, Asmodeus, you know, before Fox took me, I was sitting and reading a letter from the Ents. They say one of the Welsh green dragons they took for land cultivation evolved. In an environment with a high density of natural elements, it started evolving into a drake. In short, its wings got smaller, but the other limbs became stronger. Oh, and the fire changed, now it attacks with a strange yellow gas that puts a person to sleep for several hours as soon as they inhale it. Oh? Why wasn't I informed? I think they did write to you, you were just with Rowena and didn't notice their ravens. By the way, why do druids start using ravens? Do they think they're better than us? We use owls. Um, guys, you're getting off topic. Oops. Well, dragons. Yes, we have dragons. Asmodeus has his own, and even the kids in his magic academy ride dragons to school. Although that's only for S-class kids. By the way, Asmodeus, did Athena also evolve after the magical surge? Her flame color seems to have changed, right? Yes. She now breathes purple fire, which is poisonous. But it looks beautiful at night. Oh, interesting. By the way, Newt wants to open a zoo somewhere on an uninhabited island. People can interact with any kind of magical creature. And he wants to create the habitat himself. Yes, I know it's very inconvenient and expensive. I told him the same, but he says he'll return the money once the zoo starts working. He wants to channel the zoo's profit into environmental improvement and magical creature protection. Why not just ask for funding? 
Let him submit an application to the council. We'll allocate the funds. How much does he need? Half a million? A million? Don't tell me two million galleons, that's too expensive already. Well, he said three hundred thousand would be enough, but you know him, he won't eat himself but will spoil his niffler. Okay, we'll approve his application when we get back. By the way, about nifflers, bet he'll give somewhere between five to ten thousand out of the three hundred just to buy some luxurious things for these rascals. You think that much? I think less than five thousand. What? No, at least six thousand. Bet. On what? Well. If I win, you'll make a new saddle for Athena, with auto heating and wind protection functions. Rowena should like it. Okay, but if I win, you have to convince Valcher to give me the blood of that evolved dragon. I've already written to him, but I see he's just making excuses not to take dragon blood. Well, if you're not going to bleed him dry, then I can negotiate with the Ents. You know, they're easily bribed if you bring them various types of seeds they don't have. Regular seeds count too. Oh, my Merlin, I didn't even think about that. Okay, deal. Everyone watched as Nico and Asmodeus talked about entirely different things while they pulled out various barrels and chests from Nicholas's small bag. Tony was barely holding back from going over and trying to jump into that bag. He understands that it contains compressed space, but how exactly it works needs to be studied. Asmodeus and Nicholas continued chatting for a couple more minutes until they had everything they needed. When they finished distributing the elixir, Asmodeus gestured to everyone except Odin to leave. Guys, this is the Ancient One's personal matter, and I don't think you should be present right now. To keep you from getting bored, I'll give you this book. It was written by Newt's commander, and it describes various types of animals in our world. Asmodeus said, handing the book to Tony. Do you think you can get rid of us like children? Steve asked. Yes, Asmodeus replied, pointing at Tony, who had already left the room and was sitting in a corner, engrossed in reading. Chapter 81, The Ancient As everyone who didn't need to be present left the room, Asmodeus spoke. Show me. The Ancient nodded, and a dark mark appeared on her forehead. Whether Odin, Nicholas, or Asmodeus, all felt the dark energy coursing through the Ancient's body at that moment. This energy was unruly, aggressive, and destructive. Only those with the strongest wills could resist its corruption for a while. However, even such individuals couldn't harness it indefinitely. Honestly, inspecting the ancient, Asmodeus couldn't fathom how her body still functioned so well. The ancient chose future death for a reason, especially since she didn't truly die but existed without a physical form in an astral state. All right, let's begin. Drink as much as you can in one go. According to my calculations, when you consume around 50 liters, you should be able to sever the connection with the dark dimension. But for certainty, wait until you've drunk around 60 liters. After Asmodeus finished speaking, Nicholas added. By the way, don't worry about not fitting that much liquid into you. The elixir of life simply disperses throughout your body as soon as it enters the system. In short, you can keep drinking until you get tired. All right. Asmodeus handed the ancient a small flask and said. A spell of endless extension is cast upon it, there's over 100 liters. When you feel the bottle is halfway empty, after some time, start interrupting the connection. Nodding, the ancient began drinking the elixir. Immediately, she felt a gentle energy spreading through her body, reinforcing the link between her astral and physical selves. Sip by sip, the ancient absorbed the life energy. After about half an hour, she sensed the flask becoming lighter, but she knew it wasn't time yet. If she severed the connection with the dark dimension now, she would age into an 80-year-old woman. To maintain her current appearance, she planned to drink half of what remained in the flask, ensuring she wouldn't age visibly before Odin, Asmodeus, and Nicholas. After another 15 or maybe 20 minutes, she felt the time had come. Her body was now filled with such an abundance of life energy that even if a spear were thrust into her heart, nothing would happen. Gradually, she started breaking the connection with the dark dimension not immediately but gradually, cutting off the streams of dark mana flowing towards her through one channel at a time. When half of these streams remained, she paused. The elixir is finished. Can I have more? Oh, yes. Of course. Take as much as you need. Nicholas took the empty flask, exchanged it for a new one filled with the elixir, and handed it to the ancient. She continued gradually severing the connection with the dark dimension while absorbing the elixir. 
Another hour passed. The ancient stood before everyone, the dark mark no longer on her forehead, and everything seemed fine. Her appearance hadn't changed, she didn't age in an instant as Asmodeus had feared in case of failure. Now, the runes. Here, I'll assist. Asmodeus handed her a brochure from the Muggle world, positioning himself behind the ancient, guiding her hands on her back. He had already drawn the runic formation while the ancient was drinking the elixir, so they immediately got to work. Since the ancient's body was already accustomed to mana, they quickly inscribed three circles. However, what Asmodeus noticed were minor damages insignificant but marks left by the dark energy. Nicholas, summon Albus. Is something wrong? Everything is fine, it's just that the dark energy caused some internal injuries that the elixir couldn't heal. Ask him for Phoenix Tears. All right. Nicholas quickly left the room and headed towards Albus. Seeing someone exiting the room, Tony and Steve almost simultaneously asked, Well? Successful. Realizing that the Ancient was one of the figures protecting the Earth just by existing, they naturally didn't want to lose her and wished for her to live as long as possible. Don't distract, everything is fine. But we need something else. Hey, Albus. Do you have Phoenix Tears with you? Yes, two vials. I always carry them just in case of extreme necessity. Give me both, I don't know how much we need, but Asmodeus said she has internal injuries that the elixir of life can't heal. All right, here you go. Thanks. Without delay, Nicholas headed back into the room. When the door closed behind Nicholas, Tony approached Dumbledore. Phoenix, is this the one that can be reborn from ashes? Yes, they are essentially immortal. A phoenix won't die unless it chooses to. Truly remarkable creatures. So. In your world, there are phoenixes. Are they bred like dragons? Dumbledore, do I look like livestock for breeding purposes? No, phoenixes are even rarer in our world. Tamed ones are even scarcer. My situation is just unique. The Dumbledore family lineage carries the blood of the phoenix. There's even a legend in our family that when danger threatens a Dumbledore, a phoenix will surely come to their aid. Convenient, I suppose. Yes, convenient. I forgot. Dumbledore said and burst into flames on the spot. Ah. Put it out, put it out. Water. Where's water? Before the Avengers could do anything, a pile of ashes lay in front of them. Avengers, underscore O. He just died. Tony, did you kill the wizard? I didn't do anything. He was talking, talking, and then this. At that moment, Asmodeus, Nicholas, and the rejuvenated ancient emerged from the room. But as they stepped out, they witnessed a peculiar scene. The Avengers, clearly disturbed and bordering on hysterics, stand staring at the pile of ashes. Meanwhile, Grindelwald sits in a corner, struggling to contain his laughter. Um, guys, what's wrong? Dumbledore, he, he, he burned. He was just standing here. But now he's, he's dead. We didn't even have time to do anything. He just burst into flames and turned into a pile of ashes. Upon hearing the Avengers' words, Asmodeus and Nicholas couldn't help but smile. Gradually, it became challenging for them to contain themselves as they noticed movement in the pile of ashes. At this point, Grindelwald couldn't hold back anymore, he began laughing hysterically. Ha ha ha, my Merlin, what a perfect time for rebirth. No, really, did you see their faces? That's hilarious. Nicholas and Asmodeus also started laughing. Ha ha ha, I can't. This is simply hilarious. Oh Dumbledore, ah ha ha ha, look at your dead Dumbledore. At that moment, a small bird crawled out of the pile of ashes. Chirp. Chirp chirp. Ha ha ha. Seeing Dumbledore in the form of a bedraggled chicken, dismayed at how his wizard colleagues are behaving, Asmodeus, Nicholas, and Grindelwald burst into even louder laughter. Ha ha ha, I can't, how could you forget about the time of rebirth? The Avengers couldn't comprehend what was so amusing. Out of nowhere, their comrade burst into flames and transformed into a chick. While they had witnessed Dumbledore transforming into a bird before, it looked more like an animagus transformation. This time, he just spontaneously combusted. At that moment, the chick began to grow in size until it turned into a child of about five to seven years old. You. Why are you laughing? Believe it or not, I will fight. Oh. Little Damber is such an aggressive munchkin. Oh, look, he's taking his first steps. 
ha 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 ha. While Grindelwald and Nicholas teased the little Dumbledore, Natasha approached Asmodeus. Um, is this normal? Oh, you mean Albus's form? Well, yes, we're used to it. Is it some kind of curse? What? No, no. It's his lineage. He has phoenix blood, and all the abilities of a phoenix. So, he can be reborn when his body feels old. Phoenixes typically undergo rebirth once a year on average. So, we occasionally witness this scene. Usually, he remembers when the time is due, but when he forgets. This happens. So, he periodically goes through rebirth, then ages, and is reborn again. Well, something like that. He's immortal like a phoenix, but the aging process for a phoenix and a human is different. So, when Albus looks around 50, part of his phoenix side thinks it's time to be reborn and return to its peak. Chapter 82, Changes As the attention shifted away from little Dumbledore, Steve finally had the chance to pose his question. Could someone finally explain why you deemed it necessary to destroy a couple of blocks in the center of the Security Council? I've already said, Hydra controls the Security Council, A and D. Asmodeus paused, turning to look at the Ancient. Can you help? Show them what it'll be like without us when Hydra starts acting. He spoke this part loudly, then switched to a whisper. Don't reveal anything about the Winter Soldier. It's not the time. This? All right. But we need to go to the library, only there can we create a projection to show them. No, need. Gellert, do you have your hookah with you? Grindelwald. Yes, can't you see? Come here and show them the picture that the Ancient will transmit to you. All right. As Grindelwald added a new coal to the hookah and stood behind the Ancient, placing his hand on her shoulder, the Ancient began to open the eye of Agamotto. Green light illuminated the room. Grindelwald frowned and exhaled smoke from the hookah. When the smoke filled the room, people began to see scenes from the movie Captain America, The Winter Soldier. As the events unfolded, the previously skeptical Steve realized he was wrong, though he still disapproved of Asmodeus killing innocent people living in the area. Now he understood why Asmodeus did it. Natasha, so the shield is not really a shield? More like Hydra with a different batch. Asmodeus, in a sense, yes. Though not everyone in the shield is under Hydra's command, at least 40% of all shield personnel are from Hydra. Tony, no wonder I didn't want to join this one-eyed guy, he doesn't even control his people. Steve, we urgently need to get rid of Hydra, conduct a cleanup. In reality, the world is controlled by Nazis. Asmodeus, go ahead, we're not holding you back. Steve, what? And you? Aren't you going to help? Asmodeus, hey? What's it got to do with us? If dealing with these extraterrestrial bugs was even a bit interesting, what's the point in killing simple muggles? Tony, addressing Grindelwald, who are these muggles? Dumbledore, just humans without magic. Tony, so, I'm a muggle. Tony, um, Steve, let's take our time with this. We should thoroughly study the issue and strike when they least expect it. The whole world is on edge now, and if a new disturbance starts, they might send an army after us. Hmm, you're right. But what should we do then? Just wait. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to learn magic. What? This time, it wasn't Steve who responded, but Asmodeus. Stark, you know that ancient magic consumes life energy, and in your condition. I know, that's precisely why I want to learn magic, not only from this world but yours too. Sorry but as long as that thing is in your chest, it's impossible. Are electricity and mana from your world really that incompatible? Do you want a demonstration? Yet. Yeah. Asmodeus picked up the router from the corridor, removed a note with the inscription Chambala, and told the old folks, Hey, come here. As soon as the three approached, a cry was heard from the adjacent room. Hey. Where did the Wi-Fi go? I'm trying to order food in this godforsaken place. Ancient. She abruptly opened the door, smacked Master Karen on the head, and left. Everyone. In short, the transmitters you gave us in New York worked because one person doesn't have enough mana to completely suppress electricity. But once our mana density increases, this happens. Additionally, if I use wide-range magic, the same thing will occur, as my mana will leave my body and become active, blocking electronics. And your magic. Ancient, 
will you allow me to stay and study magic? I can sponsor Kamartaj. And food will be delivered directly by drones, no one will notice. Oh, the knowledge of Kamartaj has always been open to any visitor. We never hid it, just shielded unworthy people from magic. By the way, regarding financial support. Upon hearing Tony's words, the ancient took him by the hand and led him to meet Kamartaj, simultaneously discussing how much needed repair work there was in the temple and how she didn't want to accept Tony's funds but couldn't refuse. Everyone? Avengers, but what about spirituality, leaving your desires and all that? 1. Well, even though I've weakened, I haven't fallen that much. Wizards, maybe just give those poor wizards the philosopher's stone. As the backs of the ancient and Tony became invisible to the naked eye, another mage approached the Avengers. Master Ancient asked me to arrange accommodations for you. Follow me to your rooms. You go ahead, Odin and I will talk. All right. Once both the Avengers and Wizards left, Asmodeus turned to Odin and asked. If you release Hela from imprisonment, will it help you live longer? Sigh, everything, you know. Yes, if I stop resisting her attempts to break free all the time, I could live another hundred years without issues. But if Hela gets out, in Asgard, she'll be unbeatable. What if when she gets out, she won't even be in your universe? You mean? Yes. When we travel to our universe, you'll bring Hela with you. There she'll weaken, and with your help and the assistance of the druids, I'm confident we can seal her somewhere in my world. And what if it doesn't work? If we can't contain her, we'll kill her. In my world, there's a very dark magic. One spell takes the life of any being. Although Asgardians are physically strong, none of you, except for you, has reached the status of a true god. Thor has a chance, and Hela could have become a goddess if she returned to Asgard. But in my world, a couple of Avada Kedavra spells would kill even her. Sigh. I'm a terrible father. Perhaps, but you're also a good king. While you're partly responsible for what Hela has become, you're not a hundred percent guilty. Her divine power, it's like. Don't mention her name. All right. But you know it affects Hela's mind. If we separate her from the source of such divine energy in your universe, maybe she'll start reasoning more soundly and become less aggressive. I hope you're right. Well, I thought about it. Since we're planning to help you deal with one of the potential Ragnaroks, why not eliminate all threats this time? What do you think about giving me the eternal flame of Sir Tour? Odin, I feel that you just want to steal my trophy. Chapter 83, Change of Positions Throughout the next week, officials and even ordinary people tried to locate the Avengers, especially Asmodeus, who had detonated the Security Council Center. However, despite the efforts of various intelligence agencies, they couldn't find anyone who had been on the battlefield that day. On the SHIELD aircraft carrier, Nick Fury sorted through documents at his desk. At that moment, Hill approached him. Any news on the Avengers? Yes. Tony Stark and Steve Rogers are here. At last. Where are the others? I don't know. They didn't say, but honestly, they don't seem to be in a friendly mood. I think launching a rocket against the Council damaged the relationship with the Avengers. They are needed in the world. I don't believe they would abandon the common people to their fate. All right, why argue about it here? Take me to them. Five minutes later, Nick Fury sat at a table, looking at Tony and Steve with his piercing eyes. So, how come you're all leaving the team? Well, we found out that the actions of SHIELD and the government do more harm than good to humanity, and as for protection. That battle in New York means nothing in the grand scheme of things. Besides, you don't even know what's happening within your own organization while trying to save the world. In short, we're leaving. Natasha and Barton are leaving too. Seeing that Nick had nothing to say, Hill intervened. I, as a representative of the Security Council within SHIELD, must say, you do understand that Asmodeus has already been declared a fugitive and is considered a criminal. Do you want a manhunt open for you as well? They can try. But I want to show you what Asmodeus told us. A hologram emerged from Tony's suit, displaying the Avengers sitting in an ancient temple on cushions, chatting and drinking wine. In the video, clearly intoxicated Tony addressed Asmodeus. Asmodeus. While we understand the reasons behind your attack on the Security Council, you must realize they'll hunt you in our world. Well, at least on Earth. And in a similarly intoxicated manner, Asmodeus responded. So what? 
welcome, let them come. If they come to me before I return to my world, I'm not against destroying a couple more Security Council buildings. We could even make a world tour called Purging Useless Organizations. By the way, the same will happen if they meddle with you, you're now my wizard friends. I don't care what's happening on your earth, but I believe muggles have no right to dictate to wizards how to live. So, if they mess with you, give me a call. The next time I return, I won't mind clearing out these useless structures. Asmodeus said and fell asleep due to excessive drinking. What did you expect? Although Asmodeus's body is enhanced by mana, it doesn't mean that consuming Asgardian wine brought by Odin would leave him unaffected. At this moment, the video comes to an end. Do you want me to send you the file? Tony asked with a smile on his face. Understanding that the conversation with Tony didn't go well, Hill tried to address Steve. And you, Captain? Are you of the same opinion? You swore to defend this country from enemies. Exactly, from both external and internal enemies. That's why I fully agree with Asmodeus. Although his methods are sometimes too harsh, I support him. Politicians and other freeloaders have no right to control those who truly defend the Earth. You. That's not all. Besides leaving the Avengers and severing ties with the Security Council, we're also forming a new organization, Watchmen. It will be self-governed and not subject to the jurisdiction of the Security Council. And as I've mentioned, in case of any attempt to control, sabotage, or interfere with our activities to any degree, we will respond in kind. We are ready for war, and what about your so-called council? Both Hill and Nick simply couldn't comprehend and make sense of what happened to these two in the past week. It was as if they had been replaced. Little did they know that the Ancient One had taken all the Avengers on a journey through the multiverse, much like she will do with Strange in future. She showed them the real dangerous enemies, gave them books about the universe explaining the state of affairs in the galaxy, and revealed dark entities like Dormammu, and so on. Now they perceive the world entirely differently, they understand that so-called countries, states, nations, etc., have no significance on a universal scale, especially parasitic organizations like the Security Council, infested by Hydra. You're out of your minds. No state will let you go! exclaimed Nick Fury. I don't think so. I've taken precautions. Besides Asmodeus, I have something else. Jarvis, how are the nuclear weapon codes? Sir, I control 40% of the US nuclear stockpile. In case of threat, we are ready to launch missiles at any moment, replied Jarvis. Excellent. At this moment, Nick Fury couldn't take it anymore. He stood up and slammed the table. Tony. Do you want to become dictators? To terrorize the entire world? No, no, it's just our insurance policy. Honestly, soon you won't even notice our presence. Besides Stark Industries, we'll almost cease to be in the public eye. Our base will be beyond the reach of any technology and ordinary people in the general sense of the word. As long as you don't plan to sick your dogs on us, nothing will happen. By the way, the missiles controlled by Jarvis, if necessary, will target military bases worldwide to minimize civilian casualties. So, I say our conditions again. You leave us in our environment alone, and we won't touch you, and everyone will live in peace. We'll handle global catastrophes, alien invasions. But we won't be a tool in the hands of politicians. By the way, Nick, if you keep allowing Skrulls to proliferate among humans, we won't mind cleaning up that filthy race of thieves. Get rid of them as soon as you can. You? How did you find out? exclaimed Nick. Technology can't detect Skrulls, but magic can. Well, okay, I bid you farewell. Tony said, leaving the conference room with Steve. When the door closed, Nick, feeling powerless, slumped into his chair. He couldn't understand what had happened, how Tony learned about the Skrulls, how he lost control, and why everything spiraled out of control. Director, the Council urgently requests your presence in the meeting room. They just received news about the return of Iron Man and Captain America. Let's go. I don't think they'll like this meeting. The unfolding events left Nick Fury in a state of confusion and concern about the uncertain future that lay ahead. Chapter 84, Ostriches In a matter of minutes, Nick stood before six screens, anticipating the commencement of the meeting. Various thoughts filled his mind. No, he wasn't concerned about how the Security Council would handle the situation, especially considering that of the original eight members, six were still alive. 
Gideon Malik and Alexander Pierce were in the building that day, known to be the most aggressive in the council. Now, his worry shifted towards deciding the next course of action. Tony's explicit threat regarding the Skrulls lingered in his mind, understanding that somehow the Skrulls had angered both the Avengers and the so-called Wizards. However, he hesitated to relinquish the technological advancements brought by his collaboration with the Skrulls. Nick's contemplations were interrupted by mournful tones emanating from one of the screens. What updates have you received from Stark and Steve Rogers, Nick? Have you dispatched troops to apprehend this Asmodeus? From the first seconds, one council member aggressively interrogated Fury. Crucially, aside from Nick, none of the attendees considered it impolite, they deemed nothing more important than capturing someone who could threaten the most powerful organization in the world single-handedly. Listening to the barrage of questions from the council, Nick shook his head and said, I'm afraid you won't like my answer. We have no information on these so-called wizards. Then what the hell are you doing? Your Avengers, let them capture this madman. He dared to destroy the Security Council's base in Washington, what if he attacks civilians tomorrow? Upon hearing this, Nick Fury, with a smirk on his face, responded, Oh, so now the Security Council is concerned about civilians? I didn't notice that when you launched a nuclear missile at New York. Odd, must have slipped my attention. Fury. Don't forget who you are. Just as they put you in this position, they can remove you from it. Don't get too heated, comrade advisor. I think you should hear something. Saying this, Fury played the recording Jarvis made when Tony and Asmodeus were having a drink. After some time. How dare he? He threatens our nations. Why haven't your Avengers apprehended him and put him in custody? Oh? Do you think they're capable of that? You surprise me, I didn't know the team I assembled held such a high place in your hearts. Enough joking, Nick. I command you to arrest all the Avengers and the so-called wizards. After capturing them, we'll determine who is guilty and who is not. I don't think so, Madam Advisor. Do you dare refuse to obey the Council's orders? Me? No, absolutely not. I just believe that we can't afford to offend the Avengers right now. I believe the US military and others can handle a bunch of freaks. It's not about that. Look at this. This time, Fury played the surveillance footage from the aircraft carrier. After some time watching the video, the advisors started to pale. Previous aggression and rage were replaced by fear and awe. Is this true? One of the advisors asked with a trembling voice. I'm afraid so, Advisor Rai. I contacted the US Army and asked them to conduct a test launch of a nuclear missile into the sea. Within a minute, they reported a malfunction, unable to obtain the access code. Silence filled the room. Leave them be, let's think about our military. No need to unnecessarily lose soldiers. Nick nodded and exited the conference room. These politicians behave like pitiful ostriches, burying their heads in the sand at the sight of danger as their first choice. Not that Nick was against it, it actually helped him resolve a potential crisis today. With the council matters settled, Nick Fury contentedly went off to have a cup of coffee. Meanwhile, as Fury dealt with the security council issue, Asmodeus and Tony stood at the foot of a mountain in the Nagarjun Forest Reserve. This place was relatively close to Kamartaj and quite desolate. The newly formed watchmen decided to establish their base inside this mountain. However, they needed Asmodeus and the Ancient One's assistance. They planned to cast a significant number of anti-muggle spells first. At least to create an underground base invisible to all, they had to build it first. Without the base coordinates, Tony couldn't send robots to start the construction. The problem with this spell was not that none of the Watchmen had reached any level of proficiency in magical arts. No, the issue was that Tony was occupied with solving Stark Industries problems, Steve and Barton were relocating Barton's family to Nepal, Banner was learning anger control from the Ancient One, Thor was finally pushing Asgardian magic basics, and Natasha was reading books on healing magic but hadn't started practicing any magic for real yet. In short, until recently, if Asmodeus had cast the Muggle Banishment spell, the team wouldn't have been able to enter their own base until fully mastering magic. However, the problem was resolved when Nico exited the library and encountered mystical arts masters in training. Noticing rings on their hands, he came up with something to shield muggles from the effects of the muggle banishment spell. Nicholas created a couple of test rings containing a blend of life elixir and mana. The mana remained stable as it was linked to the life elixir, and the elixir in the rings would last for about a month according to Nicholas' calculations. Well, Shall we begin? Let's. 
I'll step back, I'm afraid that as soon as you start using widespread magic, my reactor will shut down, and I'll die. It would be the most absurd death I could think of. As Asmodeus nodded, seeing Tony gradually stepping back, he began to burn a cave into the rock. Step by step, Asmodeus felt that the cave was long enough, now it was time to dig deeper. Redirecting his flames downward, Asmodeus continued to burn the outlines of the future Watchman base. Chapter 85, The Contract Over the next three days, wizards and the Ancient One cast various spells on the cavern that Asmodeus had dug. Thanks to the spatial expansion enchantment, the cave, originally 500 square meters, now surpassed the size of a football stadium. Yet, when Tony decided to send a construction team led by Jarvis deeper into the cave, they encountered a problem. The deeper they went, the denser the mana became, causing electronic devices to malfunction. Solving this issue proved challenging. Until Tony could find a way to adapt his energy source to function in high mana concentration areas of the Harry Potter world, the Avengers had to manually set up their base. Well, at least Hulk enjoyed expanding the cave when there wasn't enough room for a sofa. While Steve and the Avengers deliberated on sofa placement, Asmodeus and Tony delved into the wellspring of knowledge, the Camartage. Each had their research direction. The book copying process continued, likely taking another month to complete. Asmodeus initially tried to figure out how to make the ancient portal work with his own mana. He thought it would be simple replace the mana source, and everything would be ready. However, the sling ring directly summoned a specific type of energy that easily opened the portal. Initially thinking it was because the mana of the Marvel world was a better fit, Asmodeus had a conversation with the Ancient One. She provided him with another book that intricately explained portal magic principles. It turned out this magic had two modes of operation, the tabletop opening of a spatial channel, and the other, drawing a spatial tunnel closer to oneself. In essence, most Camartage wizards used the latter. In reality, this magic didn't create a passage, it simply allowed the traveler to join one of the countless spatial tunnels permeating our universe. Thus, the sling ring served as a navigator for a traveler who had lost their way. As for directly creating a new spatial tunnel, only the Ancient One uses portals, this method is considered crude and impractical, consuming much more mana without any advantages over connecting to the channel. The only difference is that with the initial spatial rift, you can secure the portal to stay open permanently, whereas spatial tunnels appear and disappear, and you sustain them with your mana until you pass through. Understanding all the nuances, Asmodeus faced a dilemma, how to ensure the number of spatial tunnels in his world matches here. The rules of the world and spatial stability also made him doubt this method of travel. While Asmodeus contemplated altering portal magic, Tony attempted to make his suit and reactor resistant to magic. The only idea that seemed viable to Tony was transforming the reactor into a semi-magical state, but lacking any information, he found himself surrounded by books on alchemy and artifact creation in the library. Nicholas, out of curiosity, assisted him as he couldn't find anything else to do. Meanwhile, Dumbledore and Grindelwald decided to explore the combat magic of this world. Days passed until one day Odin and the Ancient One approached Asmodeus with a request. Asmodeus, can you witness an oath? Hey? Well, yes, I can. What are you swearing to? Camartage and Asgard will sign a treaty of mutual defense, as well as open portals from one place to another. What? Why did we suddenly decide to change the status quo, and why such a radical shift? I've been contemplating this for a while, but the imminent end for both me and the Ancient One made it difficult to make a decision. However, because of you, I see hope. Even if I die, Thor will take responsibility for the oath. If I survive, Asgard and Camartage will assist each other in their future development, and you will be the bridge between them. Additionally, it will put an end to the uncertainty in the relationship between Asgard and Camartage. You do realize I won't be staying in your universe all the time? I won't be able to resolve your disputes. We understand, but we believe that we are not children and can handle disagreements if they arise. Moreover, you will receive a copy of the contract, linked to the main agreement, so that you can communicate with us across the multiverse. All right. Will you just swear, or will you seal the contract with magic? Though I believe in the Ancient One, we decided to create a special agreement for future generations in case we eventually die. All right. I will witness the contract. Satisfied with Asmodeus' response, Odin nodded. Waving his hand, he drew a rune in the air. The rune emitted sparks of lightning, and in its place, a piece of paper appeared. The parchment looked like an ordinary old sheet, 
but Asmodeus felt a tremendous amount of mana emanating from it. Once Odin ensured the parchment was in order, he began speaking. I, Odin, son of Bor, swear to maintain friendly relations with Kamartaj, to go into the future as friends, not enemies. In times of trouble, Asgard will do everything in its power to support the land of wizards. While Odin spoke, Asgardian script appeared on the paper. Seeing that Odin had nothing more to add, the Ancient One nodded and recited her part. I, Guyi, on behalf of the Supreme Sorcerer of Kamartaj, bind the land of wizards and the dominion of the Protoss of Asgard in friendship for eternity. Kamartaj and Asgard will now and forever attack and defend together, and in times of misfortune, Kamartaj pledges to accept any Asgardian. I, Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, bearing witness to this oath, affirm the pure intentions of both parties and commit to helping resolve any disagreements that may arise. As the sole entity capable of terminating the contract until my death, I pledge to be objective and impartial towards either party of the agreement. Let this contract be sealed. As the final words fell, the contract divided into three parts and entered the bodies of the signatories. Chapter 86, The Enchantress While Asmodeus I and the Ancient indulged in tea at one of the temples, Tony read a book titled Asgardian Magical Technology. It depicted various devices that Asgard had crafted, blending magic and technology. Explanations of how these technologies worked were absent, only descriptions of their purposes existed. However, that wasn't the main focus for Tony at the moment. What mattered to him was finding a drawing resembling a reactor in the book. A reactor similar to the one Asgard activated to defend against the Dark Elves. Realizing that a possible solution to his own magic incompatibility lay in Asgard, Tony abruptly stood up and set out in search of the triad. After some time, he discovered a small temple the size of a gazebo where two old men and a young wizard were seated. Knock, knock. Enter, Mr. Stark. Upon entering, Tony saw Odin and, without hesitation, asked in a half-smiling tone, showing the picture in the book, Your Majesty Odin, King of Gods. What must I give in exchange for the opportunity to study your magical reactor? Oh, you wish to attempt to unite your technology with our reactor? Very well, my condition is this, if you succeed, you will provide Asgard with a copy of the results of your research. What say you? Agree. Agreed. Well, well. Then in a couple of days, we will head to Asgard, and you will come with us. All right. I've been wanting to see what Thor's home looks like for a long time. Oh, I'm sure you'll love it. I can confidently say it's one of the best landscapes in the universe. I can be proud of my country. So, a couple of days later, a group gathered in the middle of the Kamar Taj Square. Odin, Asmodeus, the Ancient One, Nicholas, Grindelwald, Tony, Banner, Thor, Steve, and Loki. Seeing that everyone intending to go to Asgard was assembled, Odin clenched the tesseract in his hand. As if sensing Odin's desire, the stone instantly transported the group to Asgard. Greetings, Your Majesty, welcome home. Heimdall's voice echoed as the group found themselves in the teleportation hall of Asgard. Tony opened his eyes and saw something like a gazebo behind which a long bridge was emerging, leading to a continent of immense proportions floating in the vast universe. It was a strange cosmic object, not orbiting any star, but seemingly anchored to something. Lifting his gaze, Tony saw a city of colossal dimensions, golden, shining, and thriving. Behind the city, mountains were visible, and something resembling a sky. Captivated by such beauty, Tony couldn't help but say to Steve. Still don't believe they're gods. I, uh. Hearing Tony's words, Odin said. We are not true gods, we are Protoss. At least all Asgardians except for me and Thor. Unfortunately, in the current Asgard, only I have the right to be called a true god. Thor is not yet strong enough, and the rest of the Asgardians even less so. Tony's eye twitched upon hearing how casually Odin referred to himself as a god. All right, let's go faster. After they accommodate you, I'll have to come and fix the rainbow bridge that my wayward son broke. Odin said, tossing the tesseract in his hands. Okay, let's go. Odin led the crowd across the bridge. In reality, the rainbow bridge had already been restored, it wasn't difficult. The issue was that to activate the teleportation function, it needed a powerful energy surge directed into it. Odin couldn't afford to use his power unnecessarily in his current state, so he preferred to use the Tesseract. When the group reached the end of the bridge, they were greeted by a kneeling squad of guards. Your Majesty, welcome home. 
Escort my friends to their rooms, and also inform the chefs that today there will be a royal banquet in honor of the arrival of new friends to Asgard. I will join the banquet after I finish. By the way, take Prince Loki to the dungeon. Very well, my king. Guests from afar, please follow us to the palace. While Odin went to fix the bridge, the group admired this beautiful place. Asmodeus, seeing the landscapes, thought, I won't let this place be destroyed, I must help prevent Ragnarok. Tony tried to understand how the peculiar flying ships worked. Steve, while surveying the landscapes, tried to convince himself that Asgardians are not truly gods, but looking around, it was harder for him to believe. Banner simply enjoyed the tranquility. The Ancient One examined changes in Asgard since her last visit and nodded approvingly. Ha ha ha, you all look so amusing. Yes, look at my home, Asgard, the best place in the universe. Thor walked, bragging and talking about various aspects of Asgard. The group walked through the streets of Asgard until they reached a massive golden palace. This is the royal palace of Asgard. Thor said and went ahead as he saw his mother standing at the entrance. Hello, my son. I'm glad you're well. How could it be otherwise? I'm sturdy. Mom, Dad is fixing the bridge, and he asked you to take care of our guests until his arrival. All right, Thor. Introduce me to your friends. Frigga didn't finish as if she sensed something. She froze for a moment and then turned, her gaze focused on Asmodeus. She decided not to wait for the rest of the group, including Asmodeus, and walked straight ahead. Good day, my name is Frigga. I am Thor's mother, thank you very much for taking care of him. Hello, Frigga. Hello, Guyi, it's been a while. Yeah, a long time, about 300 years. Yes, in the Pantheon. All right, let's not dwell on those fools. I wouldn't want to either. Oh, and you, Mr. Morningstar. Good day, thank you for everything you've done for Asgard. Frigga said and bowed. Um, you're welcome. I haven't done anything. Not yet, but not necessarily in the future. Chapter 87, Eternal Flame Asmodeus chose silence in response to Frigga's words. If he recalls correctly, Frigga was raised by witches who taught her the art of prophecy. He understood that she must be speaking about what he would do to prevent Ragnarok or something similar. Let's not linger at the entrance, you are guests of my husband. I will guide you first to your chambers, and then we will proceed to the dining hall. Your Highness, the King ordered. I know what Odin commanded you, don't worry. I will handle the task of escorting our friends. As you wish, my Queen. The guards bowed and returned to their routine watch. Frigga led the group through the palace. As they ascended a couple of floors, she began showing the newcomers their rooms. Even without space-expanding spells, the rooms were enormous, as if built not for human sizes but for giants. The tourist group appreciated the queen's hospitality. When it was time, each room had a maid guiding them to the royal hall for a banquet. Entering the hall, the guests saw Odin with a glass of wine, Thor with a massive beer mug, and Frigga quietly awaiting their arrival. Well, now that everyone is gathered, we can finally begin feasting. Sit and revel. Today, we entertain our guests as hosts. Tomorrow we will attend to matters, today, no worries. Odin declared as he saw everyone seated, raising his glass above the table. The group of people, gods, wizards, mutants, started the meal. Smoothly transitioning from conversations, dinner turned into the night. The next morning, Tony, with a headache, set out to find Thor. Yesterday, Odin mentioned that Thor would take him to the Asgardian scientists to explain the workings of the magical reactor. While Tony searched for Thor, Asmodeus and Odin walked down the corridor towards the treasury of Asgard. You know, I've been searching for ways to get rid of this thing for a long time, but no matter to whom in the universe I handed over this fire, it always comes back to this treasury. As if threads of destiny lead it here. But then you appeared. When you entered our universe, Frigga seemed to regain hope, and perhaps I did too. I don't know what Lady Frigga saw in the future, but I can say for sure that I don't want Asgard to fall in Ragnarok. Upon hearing the word Ragnarok, Odin paused for a moment, turned around, and said. I'm grateful to you for this. No matter how I try to avoid Asgard's fall, it seems like everything is still heading towards the end. I hope this time it's not the case. I won't let it happen. Asgard is one of the first allies of Elysium. I hope so. Okay, we have arrived. 
Odin and Asmodeus stood before the entrance to Asgard's treasury, or more precisely, Odin's vault. Nodding to the guards, Odin led Asmodeus, narrating stories of various relics he had collected during his conquests. Passing by the crown of Sir Tur, Asmodeus stopped at a peculiar-looking sphere and hesitantly asked. Orb of Agamotto. Ahem, ahem, let's not talk about that ancient. Three thousand years ago, we wrested it from the previous Sorcerer Supreme. I decided not to return this little thing, it turned out to be quite useful, helping detect mystical activity, pinpoint its location, and present a picture of what's happening. Quite interesting, but this sword seems even more intriguing. Yes, my sword. Ironically, I named it Ragnarok back in the day. Unfortunately, since that battle, I can no longer use it. It's too demanding. Odin approached the enormous sword, longer than a spear, and caressed it. If everything goes well, I believe you will be able to use it again. So cheer up. Asmodeus approached, trying to uplift Odin, who had once again fallen into reminiscences of the past. Yes, yes. All right, let's go to what we came here for. Dryly said Odin, though he saw that everything worked with the ancient, he still wasn't sure if Asmodeus's plan would work regarding him, their situations were too different. But he still accepted Asmodeus's support. You might find it strange, whether it's Odin, Nicholas, Grindelwald, or even Dumbledore. Over the course of their lives, they've long developed their own kind of pride that's hard to let go. But this only applies to those weaker. Over time, all strong individuals become extraordinarily proud, be it Asmodeus or Dumbledore. However, such pride is concealed beneath good manners. The same goes for Nicholas, Odin, and even Voldemort. In their eyes, only beings of their level deserve attention. Others, though not ants under their feet, still remain bugs in their eyes. But whether it's Odin or the other great wizards, they all see Asmodeus's potential and acknowledge his current strength, treating him as an equal even if he doesn't have the same accumulated experience as the others. Therefore, such camaraderie at their level is not considered rudeness but rather an acceptable attitude and a sign that the other side has recognized you. When they reached the cup with the burning fire, Odin said. There it is, the eternal flame. The one that foretells Asgard's destruction alongside Sir Tour. Don't worry, once I take it out of your universe, there won't be a chance for this little fire to return. Asmodeus approached the fire with interest and touched it. When his hand touched the flame, he heard a system sound. Ding, the owner has made contact with unclaimed fire. The opportunity to absorb is available, percentage absorption calculation in progress. Ding, in the current state, the owner can absorb 3% of this flame continuously. The owner's physical body is currently not strong enough to complete full absorption. Would you like to initiate the absorption process? Hmm. 3% is already good, Asmodeus thought to himself. Initially unsure if he could make this fire submit to him, now he was confident that he could gradually merge with this flame and make it part of his power. All right, I won't do anything with it while we're in Asgard. I'll study it when we're in my universe. So you don't have to worry unnecessarily. What do you think about that? As you wish. As long as this thing doesn't fall into Sir Tour's or Hela's hands, I don't care. Just keep it away from Asgard. All right. When will you be ready to release Hela from the seal? I need a day, I don't want to weaken the seal in one go. It has to be done gradually. Will you join us without any escort? Don't you want to bring Thor with you? No. He should stay here guarding Asgard. If everything works out, I'll let him play wherever he wants, but until the problem is solved. I don't want to risk unnecessarily. Okay, I understand. Let's then announce our departure. I suggest a week from now, what do you think? That works, I'll have time to settle all possible issues for the next two months. By the way, the time difference. Don't worry, I left a beacon in my universe with a time ratio of 1 to 3. It's not critical. All right. I'm curious about the magic that allows you to travel between universes. Sorry, but that's a secret. Oh, come on. Young people these days have no respect for the elderly. Chapter 88, Tony Stark, The Iron Sorcerer One day, Asmodeus and I left the vault and strolled through Asgard. Asmodeus, if everything goes well, would you mind selling a couple of dragons to Asgard when I return here? It's a peculiar request, but if you wish, please. Once we finish everything, I'll provide you with a batch of magical creatures, pairs of the most popular beings. 
By the way, your horse. It's a Pegasus. All right, the eight-legged Pegasus. What I'm getting at is, you have this Pegasus, why doesn't Thor have any animals? Oh, that idiot can't take care of any creature properly. Last time Frigga gave him a pet, it hid under the table for a week and was terrified of thunder like poison. Well then, I have a perfect pet for Thor. In our world, there's a bird that controls and feeds on lightning. Moreover, they're large enough to carry a person, even two. Oh? If that's true, I'd be happy to buy some from you for breeding. Come on, it'll be my gift to you. Just make sure they are well taken care of, or else an old man who really loves animals might come to fight you. Haha, <laughs> alright. If I get them, I'll entrust the best zoologists in Asgard to care for them. Good. Not a moment passed before Asmodeus heard the sound of an explosion. He turned to look in the direction of the noise and saw smoke rising from a building to the left of the royal palace. Just then, Odin's voice echoed, that's Asgard's scientific center, it's usually quiet. Before he could finish speaking, Asmodeus glanced at him. Um, Thor was supposed to take Tony Stark there today. Half an hour ago, Tony stood before a hologram of Asgard's magical reactor, attempting to integrate it with his own. Surprisingly, both reactor designs were remarkably similar, with the only difference being Tony's use of vibranium as the primary element for nuclear synthesis, while the Asgard ions synthesized one type of mana with another Asgard's divine energy and the cosmic energy prevalent in the Marvel Universe. Tony tried to replicate the process using his own cold synthesis instead of the direct Asgard ion method. Quickly grabbing a spare reactor, he began tinkering with the elements his reactor would operate on. Initially, the issue was with the mana ratio but Tony struggled to make the new elements synthesize until, by chance, everything fell into place. Boom. A wave of mixed mana erupted in all directions. Purely magical devices remained operational in the area around the blast's epicenter, thanks to Asgard's abundance of such devices. When the smoke cleared, Thor saw Tony amidst the wreckage, holding a reactor of a distinctly orange-red color instead of his typical blue. The reactor worked flawlessly. Stark. Are you all right? Cough, cough, reactor. Tony spoke weakly, as if lacking strength. What, what? Thor couldn't hear at first but noticed the reactor on Tony's chest gradually dimming. At that moment, Odin and Asmodeus entered the room. What the hell is going on here? Asmodeus couldn't finish his sentence before spotting the reactor in Tony's hand. He sensed that the reactor emitted more mana than his own body, around 15 to 20 percent more and this magic had a connection to both the Marvel world's mana and the magical world's mana. Asmodeus, the reactor. Tony, with his last bit of strength, managed to inform the only person here who understands the purpose of the device on his chest. Oh, damn. Asmodeus finally noticed the reactor on Tony's chest had dimmed. He rushed to Tony and carefully used magic to extract the reactor. He examined the new orange-red reactor and connected it back to Tony. Ah, ah, ah. Tony sharply took in breaths. Ahem, Thor. You idiot. I told you about the reactor. God, if it weren't for you, Asmodeus, I would have died the dumbest death from a power outage. While Tony was scolding, Asmodeus helped him to stand. All right, all right, everything's fine now. Better tell me what this thing on your chest is. I clearly sense it's producing mana, and it's mana that also suppresses electricity but can work alongside it. How did you do this? Haha, <laughs> genius is a genius everywhere, be it on Earth or in Asgard. I created a blend of a cold fusion reactor and a magical reactor. Now I'm protected from mana affecting my suit, as I can make it run on mana. Plus, I can gradually increase the density of mana produced by this little thing, increasing the input energy. In short, I can now start practicing magic without fearing death. Oh, and from this day forward, call me, the Iron Sorcerer. Maybe a sorcerer with a pacemaker. What? Ahem, never mind, just thinking out loud. Chapter 89, Preparations Before Departure For the next six days, Tony diligently enhanced his suit through various means, applying magic to it. While he couldn't independently improve his suit magically, Nicholas was delighted to have a new toy to experiment with his alchemy. The only issue was that the suit gradually deviated from the appearance New Yorkers were accustomed to. You see, Despite living for almost 700 years and adapting to modern fashion, Nicholas still cherished the old knightly suits that once existed. 
This unconscious preference led him to alter not only the internals but also the external appearance of Tony's suit. Thus, on a beautiful day, Tony's heart ached when he saw his suit. What a high-tech suit! It resembled the armor of a medieval knight joining an order like the Red Rose or a similar one. A golden helmet with pointed edges, the lower part of the suit changed too. Instead of perfectly fitted plates, the torso now featured overlapping plates, with additional protective layers on the thighs. Runes illuminated the entire suit, occasionally flickering orange. However, Tony couldn't do anything about it. Tonight, they were venturing into the universe of wizards, and he wouldn't have time to make any adjustments before leaving. Tony had already bid farewell to Pepper, explaining everything to her. She would be responsible for Stark Industries while Steve remained at the base near Camartage, guarding it and attempting to learn some magic. In addition to wizards and Odin, the magical universe would be visited by Tony, Natasha, the Ancient One, and Loki. Yes, both the Ancient One and Loki were accompanying them. The Ancient One by her own desire, eager to see the territory of Camartage and Asgard's ally. As for Loki, Odin asked Asmodeus to take him for safety reasons and paternal concern, hoping Loki could learn something from Asmodeus. At least, that's what Odin told Asmodeus when asking him to take Loki along. Odin didn't mention his desire for Loki to become a mediator between Asgard and Elysium, foreseeing the potential of such an academy. Elysium, a school gathering knowledge of magic from multiple worlds. Not that Asgard lacked books on magic from other realms, but all those magics essentially resembled the Asgardian proto-magic rooted in Yggdrasil. In short, Odin already envisioned what Asmodeus wanted to create an inter-universal magical empire and he wanted to send someone he considered family into that empire in advance. Tonight, this group was supposed to gather in Norway on one of the hills. Tony couldn't understand why they had to do this and why they couldn't simply set out from Asgard, but no one explained anything to him. Due to everyone needing to settle their affairs before departure, and Banner having to return to Earth, the group divided. Odin and the wizards would go to Norway first, as Asmodeus mentioned, we'll all have to wait for something there. Banner went to Camartage with the Ancient One, who needed to finish her business before joining the main group with Natasha. Tony remained in Asgard until the departure to continue reading local books. Speaking of books, Asmodeus had already obtained copies of most books from Camartage and Asgard, thanks to automatic quills and copying magic. Almost all books, except for certain ritual books, were now in his possession. While Asgard had more books than Camartage, they were mostly diverse in their focus, and Asmodeus didn't have to copy as many. Everyone went to their respective places. Zoom. A rainbow bridge landed in the lands of Norway, leaving Odin, Asmodeus, Nicholas, Albus, and Gellert in its wake. Is this the place? Yes. When the seal falls, it will appear here. All right, we'll be ready. You can start. Odin nodded and sat on the nearest boulder, gradually removing the seal from Hela. At the same time, near the wizards, a portal appeared, and the Ancient One, with Natasha by her side, stepped out. Has he already begun? Yes. Now that you're here, we can start forming the seal circle. What should we use for it? My little trinket here will help. Nicholas emerged, holding something resembling a black sphere for divination. I initially created it as a result of an experiment to bring ghosts back to life. I tried to give the souls of the deceased, wandering our world, a new form they could control by placing their soul in this sphere. Unfortunately, the energy constantly corroded the bodies I built for them. But to temporarily contain a still living being, this thing works better than ever. No wonder I carry it with me. Um, just out of curiosity, I've been meaning to ask you earlier. Old man, why do you carry a little ball for sealing souls? It's Albus's fault, who can't control ghosts in his castle. Every time I go to Hogwarts, I get bothered by the Hogwarts ghost, Peeves. So, one day, I decided to scare him off. It worked perfectly but he occasionally forgets what it's like to sit in emptiness without the ability to communicate. That's why every time I go to Hogwarts, it's with me. Hee <laughs> hee. Upon hearing Nicholas's explanation, Grindelwald thought to himself, can you believe they call me the Dark Wizard? He's the real devil. Setting aside the peculiar feud between Nicholas and Peeves, Asmodeus turned his attention back to the Ancient One. How long can your charms hold Hela? Not long if sealed in an object, about five to six hours. When we arrive on the other side, can you create a mirror space and seal her inside? Yes, but it's not creating a mirror space, it's opening one. 
This means we'll need to set up barriers inside that space when we arrive, but we won't have much time for that. No worries, I have an idea. What's the idea? Albus, do you remember the state Rovina and Salazar were in when they first returned to the world? You mean? Yes, let's hope Rovina and Salazar can do the same thing to Hela against her will. You know your plan doesn't sound very reliable. Do you have a better one? Well, kill her. When Gellert suggested this, Odin, who had been distracted by the wizard's conversation, joined in. Cough, cough. You're talking about my daughter, and besides, she's immortal. Literally immortal. She is death herself, and unlike Thor, she perfectly controls her power. Although she weakened, it didn't affect her basic abilities, and immortality, strangely enough, is one of her inherent traits. Let's act according to the situation. And right now, don't disturb me, your mumbling is disrupting my concentration. Hearing this, the others stepped back and continued their discussion. Only Natasha sat and watched the scene, not quite understanding what was happening. She was told it was time to go to the magical world, and if she wanted to go, she had to go now. But when she arrived, she saw the God King sitting on a stone and a bunch of arguing wizards. Time passed, and near them, the Rainbow Bridge reappeared. From the bridge's light, Tony in armor with a suitcase in hand and Loki emerged. Did we make it in time? Tony asked. Well, as far as I understand, it's still early. Hey. Okay, let's go to the wizards. They say they're preparing to seal someone or something. All right. Chapter 90, Time to Go Home After a couple of hours of waiting, Odin signaled with a weary voice, She's coming, the seal is lifted, um, 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 the rest is up to you. Hearing this, everyone prepared themselves. Asmodeus drew one of his swords from his pocket. Nicholas transformed into his battle form. Gellert opened his third eye. Albus, well, in phoenix form, his only advantage was immortality, so he simply took out his wand. The ancient formed two ruby rings of Rogador in her hands, and around her, Nicholas' sphere levitated, looking slightly different with shimmering magical circles floating around it. Tony and Natasha stood ready a bit behind the rest, as they were instructed not to engage unless absolutely necessary. Second by second, tension built until a dark green portal appeared before them. From it, Hela, the graceful goddess of death from Asgard and Odin's first daughter, emerged. Oh, I thought you might die by the time I showed up. But no matter, I'll gladly send you to Valhalla myself. She said, glancing at Odin behind the wizards. Sorry, but we can't let you do that, Asmodeus replied. And who are you? Hela asked. Just your father's friends, came the response. Well, then, to my regret, I must kill you too. As she said this, Asgardian armor appeared on her body, a dark green suit, and a black crown, proclaiming her as the queen. As Hela prepared to attack, Asmodeus shouted. Now! Behind her, a small portal appeared, and the ancient's hand emerged, holding a black sphere. Pop! Hela vanished and appeared reduced to a one thousandth of her size in the black sphere. Tony muttered, I thought we were gearing up for a fierce battle. You cowards! Why the hell, Odin, seal me again? Curses and insults emanated from the sphere, but no one paid attention. Well done! Someone cheered. Don't celebrate too soon, we have five hours, and I hope we can seal her on the other side, Asmodeus warned. All right, gather around, hold hands, each one holding the person to their right. Asmodeus, for appearances, took out the Tesseract. He had to justify the possibility of leaving this universe somehow. I left a spatial anchor based on the apparition spell in our world, with the Tesseract, I can transport us. In the reverse direction, it's the same, just without the Tesseract. Odin, you'll have to join forces with the Ancient if you want to return before we build a full-fledged spatial tunnel. All right, let's do it. Don't delay. Okay. The Tesseract within Asmodeus glowed, but in his mind, a different thought echoed, System. Let's go home. Ding, request received, opening spatial gateway, announced the System, engulfing the group in a blue beam. As the Tesseract left the universe, some violet giant on a ship screamed, impossible. Hogwarts, Quidditch Field, the sun had just risen. Rowena sits in the stands, looking at the tower. Ah, and today as well. 
the four founders decided to take turns every day to monitor any spatial activity. But two weeks have passed, and there's still no news. At that moment, Rowena felt something, and even before she could react, three more founders appeared near her. They're coming. Yes, spatial fluctuations. In the sky above the castle, a group from Asmodeus gradually landed. As Asmodeus approached Rowena and kissed her, he asked. Long time, wasn't it? Two weeks, I was starting to think you decided to escape after just one night. Do you really have such a low opinion of me? Well. All right, enough of the sweet talk. We have work. Grindelwald interrupted Rowena. Oh, fine. Rowena, he's right. We have an issue with a certain individual, or more precisely, a goddess of death. A goddess. I'll explain later. The main thing is, can you and Salazar force her into the state you were in before the magical surge, forcibly? Rowena pondered, and Salazar answered promptly, it's possible, but I'll need assistance. Where is she now? Here, Nicholas handed the sphere to Salazar. You bastards. I'll kill you all and turn you into my puppets. How dare you, I'm the goddess of death. The queen of Asgard. And you, bald old man, what are you staring at? I'll rip off your beard. Salazar clicked his tongue disapprovingly and said. An interesting tool, allow sealing the soul. Well, if you don't need this sphere, I can seal her right now. The seal will last a year, maybe two without any issues, then it needs external reinforcement. Perfect. What do you need to start? A couple of liters of dragon blood, 500 milliliters of acromantula venom, and I'll need to fetch my little snake, oh, and a mirror. Tony, who was standing behind Albus, quietly asked, what snake is that? You're better off not knowing. Um. All right, Nicholas, do you have what he needs? Yes, I carry everything with me. Good, Salazar, we'll wait here, and you can summon your snake, just please ask her to close her eyes. Oh, don't worry about that. While you were away, I made goggles for Myrtle that block her deadly gaze until I give the signal to release the restriction. Your basilisk is named Myrtle. Yes, and what's wrong with that? She's a girl, she needs a beautiful name. Your dragon has a name, why shouldn't my snake have one? Um, nothing, forget it. Salazar turned and whistled towards the castle. Tony couldn't understand why wizards were so surprised about a snake's name, but now he knows the subspecies of the snake and decided to ask Jarvis. By the way, yes, Jarvis now works for Mana and has become something like a spirit of the reactor. In short, before his trip to the magical world, Tony decided to load Jarvis with all possible information about myths, legends, and magic that he found publicly available. So he asked, Hey, Jarvis, what is a basilisk? Sir. Before Jarvis could answer, an enormous snake, about 15 meters long or even more, appeared in front of the crowd. It had four large fangs the size of swords. This is my good Myrtle. You see, her gaze is no longer deadly until I allow it. Now, I won't have to rent Thestrals from Hagrid when I go to the city. Salazar said, stroking the huge basilisk on the nose. Chapter 91, Seal and Reunion As Salazar finished embracing his familiar, the ancient opened a mirrored space. Fascinating, truly fascinating. What intriguing magic. Is this space parallel to our world? Upon entering the mirrored space, Rowena couldn't help but inquire, yes, it always exists in the world one just needs to know how to enter. It's been a while since I've seen new magic. Allow me to formally introduce myself, Rowena Ravenclaw, one of the four founders of Hogwarts. I am Guyi, the supreme sorceress of Camartage. A pleasure to meet you. And mine. With nothing more to demand from the ancient, Rowena pulled her aside, delving into discussions about the world on the other side. Meanwhile, Nicholas, Godric, and Asmodeus drew a magical circle following Salazar's instructions. Godric, we need the symbol for connection, not containment here. Oops, my apologies. It's been a while since I dabbled in alchemy, let alone magical symbols. Well, it seems I'll have to double-check every word you write. Salazar stood behind Godric, examining his progress. At that moment, Nicholas and Asmodeus almost simultaneously leaped onto theirs, declaring, I'm done. Ready. God Rick, take a look at this. Two kids beat you to it. One of them is 666 years old, 
and the other is from a different world. Besides, I'm a battle mage, not a researcher. Defended Godric. Well, yes, all Gryffindors live by the motto strength over smarts. I almost forgot, remarked Salazar. Seeing Salazar and Godric arguing again, Helga approached them. All right, boys, let's finish the work quickly. I need to get to the greenhouse, Pomona and I are trying to crossbreed the devil's snare with cabbage. Everyone except Tony had the question in their minds, why create something so dreadful? Nevertheless, with Helga's arrival, Salazar stopped teasing Godric. He ushered everyone three steps back, seated himself in the center of the previously inscribed markings, holding a black orb in his hands. To sanguinahostium inquinity, ponamchuamin specia privationes, et carceris accipias. Salazar muttered the incantation for a while, abruptly stood up, and drenched the ball with dragon's blood. Then, turning to the basilisk, he commanded, Let's go. The basilisk's eyes seemed to glow red as its gaze fell upon the blood-soaked stone. Gradually, the blood on the stone began to solidify, turning into stone, covering the orb until it transformed into a basketball-sized stone. When the black orb turned into stone, Salazar began carving runes on it. After carving the runes, he took a chromanchula venom and poured it on the stone, asking the basilisk to look at the orb again. The ritual repeated thrice in a circle until the orb became the size of an inflated basketball. All done. This seal will withstand a year without any interference. The one inside will wander aimlessly in emptiness until we remove the seal. Odin frowned, he had already caused enough harm to Hell, but this sounded like torture. At least in Helheim, there were spirits. Seeing Odin somewhat subdued, Asmodeus approached him. We have no other choice right now. When you regain your strength or we become stronger, we can make her willingly abandon her ambitions by displaying superior power. But for now. All right, no need to console me, Odin interrupted. As Ancient and Rowena approached, Tony asked, Are you done? I thought it would take more time. Thanks Salazar, he's adept at curses and dark magic. By the way, will you sense any changes in the mirrored space if Hela somehow breaks free? Yes, don't worry about it. I left a mark on the stone, if it breaks, I'll be the first to know. Good, then we can leave this place. Yes, you've all been gone for so long, we should celebrate this occasion and welcome our guests. By the way, why didn't you tell me that you brought back the Norse gods? I wanted to finish matters with Hela first, and then introduce everyone. All right, let's go. I think Helga will be pleased to organize a festive dinner for us. As everyone exited the mirrored space, there was finally an opportunity for people to get to know each other. Guests from another world, welcome. This is Salazar Slytherin, skilled in potion making and dark magic. This is Godric Greyfinder, he's good at, well, he's good at fighting. And this is our beloved Helga Hufflepuff, the best in everything related to herbology. I am Rowena Ravenclaw, knowledgeable in everything within reach, and also Asmodeus' girlfriend. Rowena glanced at Natasha. Natasha thought, did someone misunderstand something? I'm Tony Stark. Kind of an alchemist in our world. Oh, that explains your attire. Enchanted armor, right? I thought someone from the church order decided to mix with wizards. Hehe, <laughs> but it looks quite interesting. Where's your sword? You know, mine usually lies somewhere in my hat, well, if I need to summon it, I can do that too. Godric approached Tony, tapping on his suit while simultaneously searching for Tony's hidden sword. Um. I don't have a sword. Oh, so you're a true warrior. Fighting with fists? I respect that, although it's not as effective. Tony thought, why does he look the least like a wizard in my imagination? Fortunately, Odin saved Tony. I am Odin. If mythologies are the same in our worlds, I should be the king of the Asgardian gods. Hearing Odin's words, Godric shifted his attention to him. Are you a real god? Can you create a continent? Not right now, but in the prime of my power, I could destroy a planet. Cough, I'm Natasha Romanoff. Former agent, but in your terms. I'm an assassin. Pleasure to meet you, Rowena said, extending her hand to Natasha. Natasha thought, no, seriously, something is not right with her. Why is she showing so much enthusiasm? Rowena is already familiar with me. I am the supreme sorcerer of our world call me Guyi. Observing this peculiar introduction of the group, Asmodeus remarked, Helga, 
can you ask the house elves to prepare a banquet for us? We'll stay at Hogwarts today, and tomorrow I'll take our friends on a tour of the city. Oh, Asmodeus, don't worry. I asked the elves to prepare food as soon as I saw you returning. So, the festive table awaits us in the headmaster's office. By the way, Albus, while you were away, McGonagall took over your office. She said, it's so dirty here, finally, I have a chance to clean up. I'll finally get rid of these disgusting cockroach-shaped candies. So, there have been some rearrangements in the office. Albus thought, no. My candies. Chapter 92, A Magical World Tour After the feast, everyone retired to their assigned bedrooms. The next morning, Asmodeus gathered Tony, Natasha, Odin, the Ancient One, and Loki. Meanwhile, Rowena, Salazar, Godric, and Helga returned to their roles as teachers at Hogwarts. Today was Thursday, and classes were in session. Standing near Hagrid's house, Asmodeus turned to the group of tourists. Folks, I believe we should first head to the main wizarding city. My city, Adastra, is not far at all. Then we can decide where to go next. What do you think? I agree, but why did you bring us to the outskirts of the castle? Tony asked, slightly puzzled. And how do you plan to get to the city? Through the flu network? Or take a carriage to Hogsmeade? No, no. We'll get someone to give us a lift, Asmodeus replied, whistling towards the forest. Whistle. Rustle, rustle, murmur. Within minutes, sounds emanated from the forest. Roar. As the group wondered who Asmodeus had summoned, a massive creature emerged. Wait, not a cat a dragon. Black as night fur on the head smoothly transitioned into scales covering the rest of the body. Wings attached to the front paws and a beak resembling that of a wild eagle. A face with red eyes and a predatory gaze. When Tony and Natasha were about to retreat due to Athena's intimidating gaze, she meowed. Athena spotted Asmodeus and her predatory look turned into that of a kitten waiting for its owner. She leaped onto Asmodeus, licking him and purring, meow. All right, all right. I'm happy to see you too but please get off me, Asmodeus said, trying to gently remove Athena. As Athena's affectionate moment ended and Asmodeus, with a cleaning spell, tidied his clothes, he finally introduced Athena. This is Athena, my dragon. She's very gentle with friends, and she'll be our transport to the city. Welcome her warmly. Tony and Natasha were still in awe of the dragon they had just witnessed, while Odin and the Ancient One observed Athena with interest. First time I've seen such a peculiar dragon. In my opinion, she looks more like a cat. Odin exclaimed, circling Athena several times. Yes, she looks like a mix of a dragon and a panther, but her combat power surpasses any dragon in this world. Moreover, in the forest or at night, she feels much more at ease than in a head-on battle, the Ancient One remarked. A slender body. She's not large, can she really carry all of us? The Ancient One asked. Roar. Athena replied discontentedly. This bald granny doubts her strength. Quiet, quiet. Don't worry, she's much stronger than she seems. Although she's not as good at flying as other dragons, it's still her instinct. But enough talking, let me show you. Let's get on. Asmodeus waved his hand and climbed onto Athena using her wing. Odin shrugged and followed suit, with everyone else trailing behind. Once everyone was settled, Asmodeus commanded, Athena. Up, take us to Adastra. Following Asmodeus's orders, Athena spread her wings and shot into the sky with a whoosh. Tony and Natasha had to hold onto their seats with all their might, as Athena was, to put it mildly, sharp in her movements. After a couple of seconds of sharp ascent, Athena finally gained enough altitude. Periodically flapping her wings, she could sustain the flight. When Tony felt that they were finally flying forward rather than upward, and with sufficient stability, he remarked, I will never fly on a dragon again in my life. My suit is way better. Roar. How dare you belittle my flying abilities, human. Athena turned her head almost owl-like and spat a stream of fire a few centimeters away from Tony. Tony, it's better not to offend Athena. She's quite vengeful, and by the way, she fully understands the human language, Asmodeus warned. Tony gulped. Um, sorry Athena. You just flew a bit sharply. Growling. No, no. Not sharply. Everything's fine. You fly better than anyone. Meow. 
Tony thought to himself, phew, no more domestic dragons. Once Tony and Athena stopped arguing, Asmodeus beckoned the group. Hey, look to the left of Athena. The group looked down as Asmodeus instructed. They saw a small but truly magical city. A vast hexagonal square in the center, with six very wide and well-green streets branching out in different directions. If you followed the streets leading northwest with your eyes, you could see them merging into one enormous, broad avenue. This avenue was so crowded with people that not even mice could slip through. As they approached, more details of the city unfolded. Somewhere instead of houses, there was a pen with a dragon lying inside. A tower emerged with peculiar fiery clocks on it. A park appeared, featuring a fountain where beautiful mermaids swam. Not far from the park, there was a large field with strange rings levitating in the air above it. Odin smiled as he looked down at the city. Asmodeus, I must say honestly, after Asgard, this is one of the most soul-soothing places I've ever seen. You manage your lands well. Thank you, but I think someday you'll have to say, this is the most beautiful place I've ever seen, including Asgard. Asmodeus replied. Looking forward to that, Odin responded. The Ancient One joined the conversation, Asmodeus, why did you decide to build a new city? Yesterday I learned from Dumbledore that you decided to establish a village here, which gradually grew into a city. Why didn't you build it closer to the cities of ordinary people? Especially considering that modifying existing cities would be easier than building from scratch. Why create an entirely new city? Well, firstly, at that time, we didn't know exactly how muggles would react to the news of magic. Also, we didn't know that a magical surge would emerge out of nowhere. Although, honestly, don't you think this city symbolizes something more than just a gathering place for wizards? Like what? An era. A new era of this world. Magic has become an everyday part of people's lives who never even thought about the existence of supernatural forces in the world before. Though pure muggles, those without innate magical abilities and the talent of a natural wizard, are also gradually adapting to the new world, exploring magic to find new ways of utilizing it. So, Nicholas and I conducted research, and we found that a muggle turned wizard, even after completing the Three Rings, cannot reach heights in magic beyond the ceiling of this world that existed before the magical surge. At least, not unless they artificially alter their lineage. And this city, it represents a chance for development for anyone seeking a path to magic, to truth. This city is a place where, in my opinion, the creation of something greater than human civilization begins. No, not just that. This city is a symbol of the elevation of magic itself. Moreover, as someone who has lived through the last two centuries and more, you've seen people throughout history in the last 30 to 40 years, don't you feel that the world has become somewhat, different? Less vibrant, darker, even colorless. I wanted to decorate it with colors, start painting on the canvas amidst the grey skyscrapers, but it's not my path. I didn't want to begin changing the world from a place that meant nothing to wizards. That's why creating the first city in the magical world, not a village or an alley, but a city of wizards, seemed like a good idea to me. The Ancient One nodded and said nothing more. All right, Athena. Descending. Fly to the landing field. Meow. Athena began to gradually descend. They weren't heading towards the city center, quite the opposite. They were heading towards the so-called registration and unloading station for transport pets. This establishment arose due to people's need for parking spaces for their magical mounts. It was more of a whim for the rich or traders working short distances. If you transported goods through the transport network, you had to pay taxes, this didn't apply to transporting animals. As for the wealthy, as mentioned earlier, many followed Asmodeus's example and got themselves magical mounts. In addition to being much faster than enchanted cars from Weasley and family, many mounts could also move around the city if their size allowed. Driving cars in the city was forbidden, but if you wanted to go shopping while sitting on a hippogriff, that was fine. Dragons were allowed too, but only if you had a certificate of full taming issued by the Wizard Council, otherwise, it was prohibited. Currently, besides Asmodeus, there were only four such certificates, and one of them belonged to Newt's commander, indicating how challenging it is to fully tame a dragon in the magical world. Gradually, Athena descended enough for the group to jump down. Athena didn't stick around. She would wait at the Elysium Academy because she didn't like the local dragon, Frank a green Welsh dragon. Athena complained to Asmodeus that he was trying to court her. How could Athena, with human-level intelligence, be interested in that idiot who only breathed fire? 
descending to the ground, as Modius led the group. Tony, who was being pulled by Natasha, looked around with interest. A horse of black color with wings like a bat, a dragon's head, and ribs sticking out in a way that could be counted without straining the eyes. A giant lizard and a man with burning pants screaming, Merlin's beard. How did Josh convince me to buy a giant fire salamander as a mount? Left with the head of a woman. Ah, that's a sphinx, understandable. Some oversized rhinoceros. Several horses of a strange kind, this time with bird-like wings. Phew. A huge spider that speaks human language. I won't take you until you feed me. That's how Tony walked ahead, not looking at his feet until he stumbled and fell. It was strange that Tony immediately felt he had fallen into water. Getting up, Tony looked around and saw Asmodeus and the rest of the group smiling at him. Looking down at his feet, he realized he had stepped into something like a canal in Venice. Continuing to examine this canal, Tony understood that it extended from the fountain and further along the streets it was like a divider for movement in the city. People moved in different directions on either side of the canal. But as they approached an intersection, Natasha decided to play a trick on him by letting go of his hand. Tony didn't climb onto the small pedestrian bridge but went a bit to the left, falling straight into the canal. Um, Asmodeus. Why is there this canal throughout the city? Sewage. Hey? Sewage? Ew, no, of course not. This is for mermaids and sea creatures. Southern mermaids recently settled in the city, they are beautiful, nothing like their northern relatives. By the way, just before leaving, I assigned the city planning brigade to dig canals wherever possible. You might think the canal's width of one meter is a bit narrow, but the deeper it goes, the wider it becomes, reaching five meters in width and seven meters in depth in certain popular spots. By the way, in some areas of the city, we even had to put columns under the houses because they are the most visited by mermaids, and they ask to expand the space. In short, in some places, another city has started forming beneath this city. I'll tell you a secret southern mermaids can live here because the water is heated by the magic of fire. Otherwise, they wouldn't last long here. But it's for the best, Nicholas and I hope that under the prolonged influence of warm water, the northern mermaids will become more beautiful. All right. Wait, how did you deal with waste if not through the canals? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Nicholas and I had to invest a significant amount of funds back in the day. Look. Said Asmodeus pointing his finger at something like a container standing in the corner of the street. This is a micro version of a portal, it sends all the waste directly to the landfill, where one of the wizards who mastered the fiend fire spell burns it. There are people there who know how to extinguish this fire. Complete waste destruction, super eco-friendly, no smoke or residue. They burn the garbage once a week. The landfill is somewhere in Siberia, Russia. Convenient. Yes, I know. We didn't spend in vain with Nicholas. Okay, let's move on, I'll open an account for you at the bank. Don't worry, we won't put any credits on you, it's just more convenient than carrying a bag of galleons everywhere. Asmodeus led the group. After some time, they arrived at the entrance of the Adastra bank. Upon entering the bank, an elf immediately greeted Asmodeus. Master Asmodeus. Good day, please tell me how I can assist you. Lulabus, calm down. These are my friends, and I would like them to open an account in the bank. Oh, friends of the master. Please come to the VIP room, we will prepare everything as quickly as possible. Lulibus said and disappeared on the spot. Come, let's go straight down the corridor. The group followed the Asmodeuses into the depths of the bank. As they walked through the corridor, they saw glass windows showing the situation in other reception areas. One reception area was half flooded with water and the elves had to sit directly at the level of the table to avoid wetting the paper. Passing by, they even heard a mermaid shouting, My Poseidon! Why can't we just write a contract on a seaweed sheet? Why use this inconvenient paper? It tears apart from my touch. And the elf who was trying to convince her spoke with an almost tearful voice, Young lady, please calm down. We mostly use paper, but your situation is different, and we can use a seaweed sheet, but please stop flooding the bank's reception department. Turning their heads to the left, they saw a giant sitting on a chair clearly not suitable for him. Little elf. Give me money. I give dragon skin. And the elf trying to explain that they are not a pawn shop said, Mister, we are not a pawn shop, I am a cashier in the bank. You should have gone to the trading street to sell your goods there. Giant, money. 
Elf. So they gradually reached their destination. They entered a separate hall adorned in white and gold, practically shouting about its opulence. As one of the elves sitting at a table noticed Asmodeus, he stood up and approached the group. Good day, Master Asmodeus. Lulibus has already informed me about your matter. Please, come into my office. The elf led the group into a relatively spacious office with three sofas, providing ample seating. Once everyone was settled, the elf served tea and said, Sir, which of your friends would like to make the first deposit? Rassel, I think it will be this not-so-young gentleman. By the way, there's no need to deposit money, just transfer ten thousand from my account to each of theirs. Before Asmodeus could finish, Odin said, Hmm, do you take us for paupers? I was prepared. Do you accept gold? Oh, yes, sir. Odin, Odin Borson. Very well, Mr. Borson. Please, tell me the amount you wish to deposit in our bank, or the volume of gold you intend to place in the bank. Don't worry about the minimum deposit, you are already a VIP client, and you don't need to accumulate points to reach a high card level you will immediately receive our VIP card. Odin didn't quite grasp the concept of a VIP card, and he didn't really care. In Asgard, they had their currency, and being a king, he never bothered with the financial affairs of the realm. Here. Odin pulled out a small pouch from under his cloak. This pouch was blessed by the Tesseract and essentially functioned like a magically extended wallet. He reached into the bag, rummaged around for a while, and began pulling out items. A gold ingot measuring about 1x1x1 1 x 1 meter, some kind of golden shield, and a statuette of a woman in full height made of gold with rubies for eyes. Seeing Odin reaching into the bag again, Asmodeus decided to stop him. Um, I think you've shown enough. What you've already displayed is more than enough to buy anything you could wish for. Possibly even a small European country. All right, Russell, you can start counting. Russell happily went around the items, applying various detection charms to each one. Um, Mr. Morningstar, we have a problem. What is it, Russell? Well, your friend. We can't exchange the entire amount he provided. According to my calculations, it's... Russell took the bills in his hands and began counting how many galleons would need to be issued if Odin decided to withdraw them from the account. Mr. Morningstar, the 999 gold cube in our bank is valued at 60 million galleons. We can manage with that, but your friend also brought out a statuette. It is also valued at 35 million galleons, bringing the total to 95 million. So, what's the problem? Is there not enough funds in the bank? Surely the bank should have sufficient resources. Mr. Morningstar, two months ago, you withdrew around 30 million from the account. Since then, the Wizard Council increased the production of galleons to replace the Muggle currency. However, it keeps circulating, and there's currently no more than 80 million galleons in the entire bank. So, if we consider the sums in the deposits, there's more than a few billion here. But right now, we won't be able to give Mr. Odin more than 20 million, otherwise, we won't have funds for emergency situations. What? Is that the problem? Insufficient cash in the bank? Odin, did you not think about carrying the entire sum in our world's currency with you? Well, I plan to take a bit with me, but the rest could stay on the card. Excellent, excellent, Mr. Odin. Just confirm the amount you want to deposit and how much cash you'd like to receive. Asmodeus, how much does a dragon like the one we saw in the parking lot this morning cost? Well, five thousand, maybe six. That's it. What did you expect? Well, I thought I'd have to give at least half of what I brought. You old man, you have no idea about the value of money, do you? Ahem, ahem. Okay, give me 500k in cash, and the rest put on this card of yours. All right, Mr. Odin. Please, take and drop some blood on this card, it will bind you to it, and no one else will be able to use it. And here's your 500k. Russell said handing Odin a black card and an inconspicuous cloth bag. Okay. Odin nodded and stepped away. At that moment, Asmodeus wanted to say that the next would be ancient, but she seemed to anticipate his words, stepped forward, and said to Tony. Stark, you are considered a member of the Camartage. Therefore, it's an honor for you to help your master financially. Tony, I think you're just poor. But he couldn't do anything about it so he also took out the bag that Dumbledore made for him before the trip. Approaching the table, 
Tony unloaded 50 gold ingots from the bag. Tony Stark, 50 kilograms of the highest quality gold. Oh, Mr. Stark. We'll exchange 50 kilograms for 628,000 galleons. How much do you want to deposit into the account? Put 300,000 on my account, 300,000 on the bald woman behind me, and 28,000 on this girl. Oh, all right, Mr. Stark. May I ask you to approach, dear ladies? Ancient and Natasha approached the table and also dropped some blood on the cards. Chapter 93, A Tour of the Magical World Part 2 Having completed all their tasks, the group exited the bank. Standing at the intersection not far from the Asmodeus Bank, Asmodeus asked the group, Now that you have the money of our world, what do you wish to spend it on? Odin and Ancient One remained silent, content for now to simply explore the magical world. Thus, Tony and Natasha were the only ones intrigued by Asmodeus's offer. Seeing that Asha was unsure of her plans, Tony was the first to ask Asmodeus, I want to visit the bookstore and the materials store. Ah, good choice. Materials for potions and alchemy. There's a shop with good prices and a wide selection not far on Omnis Street. But why the bookstore? You can use the libraries. Of Hogwarts and Elysium whenever you want, and basic books can be copied. For my personal collection. As you wish. Well, if no one objects, we'll head to the Omnis Trading Street, and I'll take you to the magical materials section. The group was more than happy to comply. After some time, they found themselves on the liveliest street they had ever seen more than just lively, it was extraordinary. Giants, centaurs, goblins, mermaids, wizards, even annoying little fairies and garden gnomes were selling, shouting, and arguing with each other. While they had seen most of these magical creatures before, it was the first time they witnessed such a gathering of both non-human and human beings. Even Odin and Ancient were surprised. How did you manage this? I mean, how do all these creatures coexist without showing any obvious aggression towards each other? Inquired Ancient with curiosity. What's so difficult about it? As long as you treat others differently, they'll behave like monsters, but when you understand these beings and start getting along with them, you realize that any of them can be a pleasant companion. Take, for example, the Cornish Pixies. They were always disliked for being pranksters and enjoying mischief against wizards. But we found a use for their talents. Now they work in entertainment centers for daycare. We explained the limits of what they can and cannot do, and allowed everything else. Now they happily play the role of babysitters for children, amusing and entertaining both kids and parents. Although they don't speak human language very well yet, they're gradually learning. There was nothing complicated about it. Mermaids, in turn, were perpetually dissatisfied with muggles fishing in their territory and the pollution of the oceans. But now, with fishermen unable to go out to sea, we've established communication. Mermaids supply seafood and certain goods from the depths of the sea, and we invest in their development, building magic schools for mermaids. We even have a joint project to restore Atlantis. Take these garden gnomes, unpleasant fellows. Before the Wizard Council, in the Ministry of Magic, classified them as pests, not even considering them a fully-fledged magical creature, but even they found a purpose. They enjoy digging tunnels and loosening the soil, so why not give them what they want? Now, they assist in agriculture, hunting real pests, and many of them have joined in creating an underwater network for mermaids. Centaurs initially resisted joining our society due to their pride. However, when they realized that beings with a certain level of intelligence, including them, are now qualified as inhabitants of the magical world, they gradually agreed to some contacts with society. Now, they provide some divination services. The most challenging were the giants. To put it mildly, they are foolish but highly aggressive. Yet, even with them, agreements can be reached after mana rings optimize their bodies. Instead of humans, dragons have become their delicacy. By the way, giants are now responsible for dragon breeding. They are sturdier, and working with dragons is less dangerous for them than for wizards. Not that humans have completely exited the business and handed it over to giants, no, humans are more involved in processing dragon materials, ensuring breeding standards, and so on. Giants are now herdsmen. In short, we managed to find applications for almost all magical races in our world. The key is to understand them and allow them to engage in what they enjoy with certain limitations. Unfortunately, both werewolves and vampires are still feared. However, we've created special institutions to help them. For instance, in blood banks for vampires, 
people donate blood on a charitable basis, and each vampire can receive a packet of blood for free once a day. Despite vampires having a less favorable reputation in the magical world, many muggle girls and women are eager to have relationships with vampires. Vampires owe a lot to authors who wrote about love with vampires. As for werewolves, there's no complete solution yet. Special institutions have been created for them, where they can wait out the night of their frenzy. Additionally, if a werewolf registers their data, they are provided with two vials of wolf spain every month. This way, we aim to reintegrate werewolves into society and also try to explain to other creatures that werewolves are not so dangerous, only during the full moon. With Asmodeus's narration in the background, the group gradually approached the small shop. The shop stood out among its surroundings with its design. Originally, it should have been a similar cottage like the others, but now the building was wrapped in a tree, its canopy above the roof creating a pleasant cool zone near the store. The facade of the building was covered with moss and various vines descending from the roof. The disproportionately large door, almost two stories high, particularly stood out. Above the store entrance hung a wooden sign with the inscription, Axis Alchemy and Potion Crafting Materials, Best Quality. This is the shop of my good friend. Let's go, and don't be surprised by its appearance. Ding, ding, ding. The group entered the store and heard a very slow and rough voice. I'm coming, I'm coming. Give me some time. While the shop owner was approaching, Tony examined the store. It turned out to be much larger than it appeared from the outside. He already knew it was due to the influence of a space-stretching spell, but what caught his attention was the ceiling height. It was disproportionately high, even in the large space they were in. Roughly estimating, Tony thought the ceiling height was at least 20 meters, and that was just one floor. Tony thought, maybe the owner serves giants right in the store. Without paying much attention to the room's dimensions, Tony decided to inspect the interior, which clearly differed from what one would see in a regular shop. Chapter 94 a Tour of the Magical World, Part 3 The interior practically shouted, Someone who loves nature lives here. It was evident in every element of the shop's decor. Shelves crafted from thick bark of some tree, surprisingly sturdy. Various materials from magical creatures adorned the shelves, yet upon closer inspection, only those obtained with the consent of the creatures were present no forcefully acquired items. The chandelier hanging from the ceiling was made from interconnected deer antlers, emitting a soft glow at their tips. Walls were adorned with various vines and plants, occasionally revealing a magical creature peeking out from a burrow arranged in the floor. As Tony admired the space, a creaking floor sound caught their attention, and the group turned. Behind several shelves, an enormous palm appeared, unmistakably non-human. Gradually, a foot, around five meters long, emerged. Tony, suspecting the creature, witnessed before the group an immense ant. Oh, Asmodeus. Hello. Valcher already told me you're back, but I'm delighted that your first visit was to my shop. If you want to buy something, choose whatever you like. You know, there's always a discount for you, the deep yet friendly voice echoed. Hello, Axis. Yes, we returned yesterday, and I'm glad to see you too. But today, I'm not the main buyer, our guests from afar are. This is Tony Stark, he wants to purchase various materials for alchemy and research, Asmodeus said. Hearing Asmodeus' words, Axis's eyes focused on Tony. Greetings, friends of Asmodeus. I can assure you that the quality of our materials, endorsed by the Ents Council, is the best on the market. Even materials from magical creatures are gathered only with their consent, and we never harm these little beings. Tony still struggled to fully grasp that he was conversing with a tree, yet he decided to go through the list he had compiled in his mind while walking through the city. Mr. Axis, I'll need, dragon blood. Unicorn Horn, the fur of an invisible creature. Tony continued the list for another five minutes, occasionally mentioning materials that even Asmodeus found surprising. When Tony finished, Axis looked at him with an assessing gaze and said, Are you sure? Forget about the fact that some materials on your list are extremely rare, but why such a quantity? You know, a potion shop doesn't use this many materials in a month. I'm sure. I need all possible materials for research and improving my armor. So, how much will everything I've mentioned cost? All right, all of this will cost you 90,000 galleons, and you'll have to wait until tomorrow evening to come and pick them up because I don't even keep troll skin here, and I'll need to write to my brothers to send some materials. Okay. Do I need to make a prepayment? No, I believe the one Asmodeus brought is quite well off. 
just come with the full amount tomorrow evening, after five o'clock. Okay. Throughout the remaining day, the group wandered through the city, occasionally stopping by various shops or cafes. Odin and the Ancient found this pastime quite novel, and they were very pleased. As for Tony, he spent half of his funds ordering various materials, potions, and even magical weapons. They left the city only after midnight. The next day, Tony, accompanied by Natasha, returned to Astrastra to await their delivery. Of course, he didn't intend to just sit under the shop until evening. Instead, he went to a local bar, conversing with wizards and enjoying the brandy he discovered yesterday, primarily made with dragon blood. As for Asmodeus. 12 o'clock, Hogwarts. Asmodeus sits at the table, with Odin in front of him. Nicholas informed me that he's ready. Now we need to decide on the sequence of actions, and we can begin. Good, how do you propose to proceed? As I've mentioned before, and you probably sensed, the mana in our world is softer and more pliable. By using it, we will suppress your divine energy. However, for this, you'll need to release a lot of energy sharply. So, I need to unleash something without holding back. Yes. So you don't accidentally destroy half the planet, I'll ask you to shoot into the sky, preferably in the opposite direction from the moon. That's not a problem, I'm concerned about the reverse reaction of my body when I use such power. For this, we use an elixir. A lot of elixir. Before you begin releasing energy, you must drink the elixir, twice as much as the ancient consumed. Once you do that, you'll have a period of time during which you must release the excess energy. After you rid yourself of divine power, you'll need to quickly start absorbing the mana of our world into your body, using the magical circle I'll provide you. The action must be swift to prevent your own power from recovering. When the energies reach balance. We don't know what will happen, but Nicholas and I hope that these two types of energy will merge into a new one. Additionally, once you feel that balance is established, you must continue drinking the elixir until the so-called energy fusion occurs. And what if the energy fusion doesn't happen? Fine, let it be. In any case, I've averted one of the possible Ragnaroks of Asgard, and if not for this attempt, I wouldn't have had another chance. Chapter 95, Blood Brother A few hours after Asmodeus spoke with Odin, a gathering took place in the inner courtyard of the Elysium Academy Odin, Asmodeus, the Ancient One, Nicholas, Rowena, Salazar, and Dumbledore. This assembly was due to Godric and Helga attending classes, while Rowena and Salazar were more interested in the amount of energy Odin would release. Nicholas, Asmodeus, and Odin separated slightly from the group. Nicholas began taking out vials of elixir, preparing twenty-five similar to those used by the Ancient One. While Nicholas arranged the vials, Asmodeus drew a magical circle akin to the ones recently employed by muggles to transform into wizards, albeit modified. Now, the magical circle didn't direct mana to the heart but facilitated the introduction of mana into the body, with Odin controlling it thereafter. After a few minutes, when Nicholas and Asmodeus finished their preparations, Asmodeus approached Odin and said, We can begin. Are you ready? More than ever. If anything happens to me. I and the Ancient One have already promised to protect Asgard, but I believe everything will go well. You just need to follow our plan. All right, thanks again. Whether it works or not, you will forever be the friend of Odin the greatest king of Asgard. With these words, Odin took the elixir in his hand and began consuming it in gulps, as if quenching a millennium-long thirst. Over a certain period, Odin tried to drink as many vials as he could until he sensed that further elixir consumption wouldn't help. I feel the efficacy fading, moving on to the second stage. Odin tossed a vial from his right hand, entered the circle drawn by Asmodeus earlier, and extended his right hand. As if summoned by Odin, a sword gradually materialized in his hand the same sword he once wielded in battles against Celestials. Odin took a deep breath and slowly drew the sword back. Exhale. A golden trail of energy soared into space, slicing through the atmosphere like a sheet of thin paper. The group behind Odin held their breath. If that strike had landed on them. Forget about them, focus on the earth. Asmodeus wiped sweat from his brow and thought to himself. Fortunately, I suggested aiming for the space. I fear it would have split the planet in half. Odin wasn't concerned about the strength of his strike. The sword in his hand disappeared immediately, and Odin, holding another elixir, sat within the magical circle. If one didn't pay much attention, it might seem like an old man meditating in the park. However, the gathered wizards here keenly felt the conspicuousness of Odin's behavior. 
those attuned to mana could sense thick streams of mana converging directly into Odin. Some young wizards even briefly wondered if the mana amplifier had been turned off today, as casting spells had become unexpectedly difficult. While Odin absorbed mana from the surroundings, Asmodeus skeptically gazed at the sky. Um, guys, if I remember the planet positions correctly, during this time, Mercury should be in the direction where Odin directed the strike. Asmodeus hesitantly asked after a moment of contemplation. Realizing that Odin might have sliced off a piece of Mercury, the group decided to keep quiet about this small mishap. Fortunately, the connection with satellites was severed, and the magical world was no longer concealed, otherwise, the non-magical government would have had to come up with many stories. What they didn't know was that when someone's strike reached Mercury, many seers and centaurs exclaimed. This is impossible. Why is Mercury's influence almost absent in the new prophecy? Luckily, aside from a few individuals, only astrologers and prophets learned about this incident. Somewhere in space, a detached piece of Mercury drifts. Wizards didn't have much time to ponder Mercury because now they witness a mist forming around Odin. It's the mana he gathered around himself, its density so high that even the naked eye can now discern mana particles. When wizards thought Odin had entered the final stage, they heard a voice in their heads. Go, I'll need three days to balance the energy levels. Also, don't turn off the mana amplifier. Once Odin's voice disappeared, Asmodeus smirked at Nicholas, looks like we underestimated Odin's energy reserves. Yeah, but maybe it's for the better. More time means more beneficial mana from our world in his body. I hope so. All right, let's not disturb the old man, shall we? Let's go have a drink. What should we drink to? For the repose of Mercury. Tonight, for the first time, the group gathered to honor the memory of the planet. Over the next two days, Odin occasionally waved his hand to have elixirs fly into it, but most of the time, he remained still. However, the park area around him changed beyond recognition due to the influence of mana. Ordinary plants began mutating, and because this mana was mixed with Odin's residual divine energy. Have you ever seen a weed that runs around and shoots lightning at everyone? Well, students from the school who decided to take a stroll in the park witnessed not just a weed. A dandelion with a top resembling a cactus. An apple tree with golden apples eating one made you feel energetic and strong, the effect lasting about a week. Asmodeus even spotted something resembling Pikachu running through the park. In short, a certain area of the Elysium Park transformed into a sanctuary of mana with elements of lightning and thunder. Newt even mentioned that after Odin leaves, he'll have to relocate the Thunderbird group, as they've been trying to break through to Odin for the past two days. Today marks the third day since Odin said he needed time. Asmodeus gazed at Odin, surrounded by golden energy, and pondered the lightning element. I master two elements perfectly fire and air. Fire magic in my hands ultimately boils down to mass destruction, while air is convenient for defense and flight. Sometimes it can be used for pinpoint attacks, but it's still not as convenient as using lightning in the world of the Avatar for maximum damage in one spot. Lightning, lightning. I should learn the lightning magic of this world. Redirecting lightning is certainly convenient, but if I can seamlessly use lightning magic as I use fire and air magic. Hehe. <laughs> that would be interesting. Asmodeus' reflections were interrupted by Odin, who abruptly opened his eyes. Inhale. With a light movement, all the energy that had previously surrounded Odin entered his body. Without pausing his movements, Odin took two vials of elixir and quickly started drinking. In a few minutes, when there were no more vials left, and the energy in the surroundings had emptied, Odin patted his stomach and joyfully laughed. Ha 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 ha. It worked. Celestials. Gods? Come, I'll beat you so hard your own mothers won't recognize you. While Odin happily taunted, his body began to undergo a radical transformation. The belly that had protruded in old age started to shrink, gradually replaced by a slender waist. The previously slightly hunched back straightened, pushing forward a proud chest. Muscles throughout his body once again filled with strength and vigor. After some minutes, the old man Asmodeus had been watching transformed into a middle-aged, muscular man with a long beard, an aggressive smile and an eye patch that left Asmodeus wondering was this the king of gods or a pirate. But one thing was certain Odin had returned to his peak. One of the mightiest beings on the level of the single universe, he had once again become someone who could crush anyone opposing Asgard. Though Odin currently showed no aggression towards Asmodeus or this world, Asmodeus distinctly felt a sense of subjugation, as if a lizard was staring at a dragon. Odin gradually regained himself, 
and realizing that his energy was slightly leaking, he sighed. The pressure Asmodeus felt instantly lifted. Odin smiled and happily walked towards Asmodeus. Congratulations! Before Asmodeus could express his congratulations, he felt Odin hugging him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If not for you, thank you. Odin hugged Asmodeus tightly once again and stepped back. Just as Asmodeus thought the old man's emotional state had stabilized, he saw Odin's sword reappear in his hand. Odin grasped the blade with his palm and pulled sharply. Blood flowed from the hand of the king of Asgard, and he began to speak. I believe words of gratitude are inadequate, and what you received in return for helping me is incomparable to what I gained from this. Odin paused for a moment and spoke again, I am Odin Borson. King of Asgard and Guardian of the Nine Realms. Born under the blessing of Yggdrasil, endowed with its wisdom and glory. I swear never to harm Asmodeus nor in Morningstar. To remain his friend henceforth and forever. As Odin spoke, runes began to appear around him, and behind him, the silhouette of a tree started to take form. I swear to protect him and assist him in any way I can. I swear henceforth to call Asmodeus nor in Morningstar my brother, by blood, I affirm this friendship. And may my soul never enter Valhalla if it be otherwise. Yggdrasil the world tree, confirm this oath. The silhouette of the tree behind Odin began to glow and sparkle. The blood flowing from Odin's hand started to rise in the air, forming a peculiar runic symbol. Once the symbol was formed, absorbed by the silhouette of the tree, Asmodeus felt something akin to a door opening in his mind. If focused, he could sense where this door led to the roots of Yggdrasil, where Odin once gained his wisdom in exchange for an eye. Gradually, the silhouette of the world tree disappeared, leaving only the smiling Odin and the stunned Asmodeus. Odin, you. Asmodeus, without you, even if I had resolved the issue with Hela, Asgard would still face Ragnarok, one way or another. But you, you return to me something that can give me confidence in tomorrow my strength. Thanks to you, for the first time in one thousand years, I see a way out and am not afraid of the future. That's why, among all those I know, you deserve this. What Yggdrasil gave you when I acknowledged you as a brother is access to exchange with the World Tree. This is only available to members of the royal family of Asgard. When you become strong enough, if you pass the trial, you will receive from Yggdrasil what it deems most suitable for you. You will feel it when it deems you worthy of the trial. Asmodeus nodded heavily. He understood that Odin wanted to repay him for the salvation, but still thought it was a bit much. Odin essentially granted him the status identical to a member of the royal family of Asgard. I swear. In the face of a threat to Asgard, I will be there. Haha, <laughs> that's good. Let's go have a drink, I haven't been this happy in a long time. Odin laughed and, patting Asmodeus on the shoulder, walked towards Hogsmeade. Chapter 96, Division of Forces On the following day, Asmodeus approached Rovina with a question, Rovina, we need you for the council meeting. Already? It's not even ten o'clock yet, and the meeting starts at eleven. I know, but before that, I wanted to ask you something. I've been curious for a while, but I always forget to inquire. How were wizard levels divided in your time? I'm interested in where Odin stands compared to our assessment system. Oh? You don't know? Not that I'm completely clueless. I understand where the dividing lines of levels are, but I don't know the names of the wizard levels. Let me start from the beginning then. Throughout our history, great mages in our world adhered to a specific system of division. Wizard, in the past, merely being a wizard was a prerequisite for admission to a magic school those born with mana and experiencing magical surges. High wizard, those who have achieved significant success in magic, individuals who graduate from Hogwarts are considered at this level. By the way, aurors are also at this level. No matter how well trained an auror is, they remain simply a more powerful high wizard. Master wizard, to put it more simply, at this level, you find the four heads of Hogwarts. Each is strong in their own specialization, but even an herbologist at this level can easily handle a team of Aurors. Grand Wizard, currently, Godric and Helga are at this level, they haven't quite reached the level of Archmage. However, even at this level, no matter how many Aurors or Master Wizards there are, it won't affect them. Strength Assessment, capable of single-handedly destroying a small town or village. Archwizard, this is the level where you, I, Albus, Nicholas, Grindelwald, and Salazar currently reside. I don't need to explain how powerful we all are, right? We can easily annihilate a large city, and some can even battle armies alone. 
What comes after Archwizard? I'm not sure. I only know that the prefixes don't change, and beyond wizard, people referred to themselves as enchanters. By that logic, it would be Enchanter, High Enchanter, Master Enchanter, Grand Enchanter, Arch Enchanter. Well, something like that. All right, forget it. I think Odin is way beyond Arch Enchanter. Yes, I've never seen a wizard who could cast a spell equal to the swing of Odin's sword. I believe we'll reach his level someday. I never doubted that. Haha. <laughs> okay, let's go to the meeting. Oh, why did I establish this wizard council, listening to these reports is so tiresome. Are you unhappy being, in fact, the emperor of the planet? Wow, that's audacious. Oh, come on, I'm not unhappy. It's just that I'm lazy. Saying this, Asmodeus took Rovina by the arm, and they headed towards Adastra, leaving Hogwarts. They didn't fly or ride on broomsticks, they simply walked slowly, talking about anything that came to mind. Thirty minutes later, Asmodeus and Rovina were already seated around the round table. Today's meeting had not only the members of the upper chamber of the wizard council but also the entire lower chamber surrounding them. Well, since everyone is in their places, let's begin. Each of you received a folder of documents yesterday. They contained various types of magic that we, along with the elders, acquired in exchange for helping people from another world. Today, I would like to determine the types of magic that we can quickly introduce into the world and find practical applications, especially in agriculture, construction and transportation. These three areas concern me the most at this stage. After hearing Asmodeus, someone from the lower chamber spoke, Mr. Morningstar, on behalf of the Transportation Development Department, I request your permission to transfer the task of optimizing portal magic to the research department. Our specialists have already tried to study how to integrate our teleportation magic with the portal magic of Kamartaj, but we encountered a problem. We can't stabilize the new type of portal in a specific location permanently, it either disappears or goes somewhere else, too dependent on the wizard using the machine. Our goal is to establish a stable transportation system. So, we would like to ask you to transfer the task to the magic research department. All right. The research department will take on this task. Research group, no. We want to rest. And one can understand them. After returning from the Marvel world, Asmodeus and the other archwizards each chose two to three books and started their research aimed at improving their personal combat abilities, almost ignoring the needs of the world. Now, most of the research related to improving living conditions and quality of life is carried out by people from the research group. The agriculture department requests permission to use mirror space magic to increase the breeding area for livestock. Approved. But why? Doesn't the spatial expansion spell solve the problem? There is no problem with land, but if the description is correct, we can save on building pens and enclosures for livestock. All right, permission granted. But I designate the territories from Hogwarts to the Elysium Academy as a restricted zone in the mirror dimension. Don't go there. Okay, I'll inform all future workers. Oh, Chairman of the Council, the Urban Planning Department has a question. Can we refrain from installing portal systems in other parts of Adastra until a ready new version of portals appears? It depends on how long it will take for our department to optimize the portals. If it's more than a month, there's no need to wait further. Install our standard portals. They're not that far behind the ones used by Kamartaj. Just leave space for the old portal variant during construction, it's much more demanding in terms of size and materials. Yes, sir. So. Over the next couple of hours, Asmodeus and the Council determined where and how new types of magic could be applied as soon as possible to improve the quality of life for the population. When the meeting ended, Asmodeus and Rovina headed to the Tower of Magi. Chapter 97, The Magical World Through Rachel's Eyes, Part 1 While Asmodeus and Rowena amused themselves. In the familiar town of Alfriston in East Sussex, Rachel read a report on the farm productivity in the county. 16.5 tons per hectare. Potions truly work wonders. Comparing the new statistics with those of previous years, Rachel marveled each time at how much wheat, barley and other grains farmers had managed to grow in just six months. Yes, in six months. You heard it right. Thanks to potions and druidic magic, grain crops can be harvested twice a year. Not to mention potatoes and vegetable crops, farmers anticipate harvesting five to seven potato crops per year. This is simply unprecedented. If this continues, the world will forget about hunger and embark on a path of food overproduction. 
Rachel thought cheerfully to herself. Knock, knock. Coming. Her reflections were interrupted by a knock on the door. Tidying herself up, Rachel approached the door. Creek. Rachel Thorbles, responsible for the East Sussex region. Yes, it's me, and you. I'm the new courier for the Wizard Council. Due to a shortage of owls lately and the lack of sufficient numbers of beetle phones among government officials, the council has decided that important assignments and information will be delivered personally, hand to hand. Oh, all right. So, what do you have for me? Here, a letter from the council. Tomorrow at 2 p.m., the gathering of wizards responsible for regional development begins. In addition to a session focused on discussing future funding, development, and enhancement of regions, the assembly will showcase new devices that can be useful in magical agriculture. Here's your ticket. A piece of advice arrive half an hour early, or you'll find yourself waiting in line at the entrance. Representatives from all European countries and even a few Asian countries will be present at the assembly. All right, thank you. How much do I owe you for the delivery? Miss Thorbles, I am a government employee too. The council covers my payment. Have a pleasant evening. Okay, goodbye. Closing the door behind her, Rachel headed to the kitchen. Sitting at the table, she set aside the ticket and opened the letter. Responsible for District 102, England. Rachel Thorbles. This letter is sent to all those responsible for the stable development of the magical world in regions. We invite you to attend the exhibition showcasing the latest achievements of wizard researchers in the fields of agriculture, construction, and transportation. The Council recommends attending the exhibition. Expenses for accommodation and meals at the Hogshead Inn will be covered by the Council. Please keep receipts for payment and provide them to the Council upon completion of the exhibition. If you believe that a particular product presented at the exhibition could aid in the development of your region, you may contact the Department of Regional Development Financing for additional funds. The Regional Development Funding Department will open a temporary branch at the Hogshead Inn where you can submit your request. If your request is well-founded, funds will be granted for equipment purchase. This letter is accompanied by a ticket to the exhibition. The ticket also serves as a port key, departure at 1 p.m. If you fail to use the port key in time, you'll need to make your way to the exhibition using your own means. Thank you for your attention. Rachel read the letter and set it aside. 1300 hours. I'll have to postpone the inspection of the reconstructed buildings for a couple of days, she thought to herself. Taking a sheet of paper, Rachel began to write, rescheduling the inspection of reconstructed buildings. She spent about five minutes composing an official document explaining the reason for postponing the inspection of recently reconstructed buildings. Once finished, she handed the letter to a small owl sitting on the table. This owl, named Puffy, was Rachel's choice for delivering official documents. By the way, Puffy belongs to the domestic owl breed, meaning she can carry only a few letters at a time. Sending Puffy on her way, Rachel completed some paperwork and officially ended her workday. Standing up from her desk, she was about to head to the kitchen when she turned around, as if she had forgotten something. Ah, there you are. Rachel picked up the wand lying next to the quill she had been using. Sensing that everything was now in place, she waved the wand, and her formal attire transformed into a casual outfit. Nodding in satisfaction with her clothing choice, Rachel headed to the kitchen. Opening the refrigerator, she felt that something was amiss. I need to cast the freezing spell on the fridge again. Rachel stepped back from the fridge but left the doors open. Glacies. With a wand wave, a mist began emanating from its tip, heading straight into the fridge. After a couple of seconds of continuous cooling, when a layer of ice reappeared on the fridge walls, Rachel finally lowered her wand. Ground beef, parmesan, onions, peppers, tomatoes. She began listing the items needed for her meal. With wand flourishes, products flew out of the fridge one by one and landed on the table. Take me to the magic of the moment on a glory night. Rachel sang softly, satisfied, as one of her favorite songs played in the background. Rachel enjoyed the song while preparing dinner, occasionally glancing at the book on the table titled Magic for Housewives, 100 Best Spells for Cooking. After a short period, Rachel finished cooking and sat down to eat. Once done, she looked at an intriguing version of clocks that became popular due to the absence of electricity. It was a mini version of the clock tower in the city of Adastra, but instead of fire, the hands seemed to be crafted from condensed mist. Checking the time at 6.25, Rachel washed the dishes using a clearing spell. After cleaning up, 
she headed to the main hall where a television used to be, now replaced by two beetle phones, one of them noticeably larger, about the size of a big cat. This was the latest version of the beetle radio, born from the overfeeding of phone beetles on one of the farms. The initial batch of these devices was nearly destroyed, but they ended up being handed over to researchers, resulting in the creation of this peculiar living gadget. In short, bigger equals louder. In fact, the functions remained the same, but mobility was almost non-existent, and it recorded voices poorly. However, when paired with the latest version of the phone beetle, featuring an improved microphone, it transformed into an online broadcasting station. Due to the prevalence of phone beetles among musicians, every day on the radio turned into a live concert. Simply put, a musician or a band with a phone beetle gains access to the transmitter beetle, which then relays the signal to the radio beetles. It might sound convoluted, but in practice, not much changed for radio users. Rachel approached the radio, singing along. Living just to find emotion, hiding. Somewhere. In the night. Don't stop. As the final lines of the song concluded, Rachel stroked the radio's back and said, lower the volume to level one for two hours. Request accepted. The beetle wiggled its body, and the music grew softer, almost imperceptible unless one listened carefully. Rachel picked up another beetle lying to the left of the radio her phone. It was now 6.35, and she needed to make a call, otherwise, her little mischief maker would be upset. Seated in the chair, Rachel asked the beetle to call her beloved daughter. Margaret, hi. How was your day? Yesterday, Rachel had talked with her daughter for almost two hours before heading to bed. Waking up early around 8 a.m., Rachel had breakfast and, dressed in unremarkable clothing, went to the village. Approaching the nearest house, she knocked on the door. Ray, it's Rachel. I need to check the results of the cultivation. You know it's an important order for our village. Rachel stood at the door for five minutes, but no one answered. It was strange because it was already 9 a.m., and the Wolfson family were farmers who rose very early, she sometimes saw them working at 6 a.m. Realizing something was amiss, she became wary. Taking out her wand, she said, Alohomora. The door opened, and as she was about to search the house for potential intruders or unusual things, she heard the shouts of an adult man. Hey, you bastards! Stop bouncing! Ouch, that hurts! Who rammed into my eye? Elena, help! These things have gone mad! Recognizing the voice's owner, Rachel headed deeper into the house, where the greenhouse was located. When she opened the greenhouse doors, she witnessed a chaotic scene. On the ground, in the middle of the greenhouse pathway, lay a 45-year-old man covering his head and his other head. Surrounding him were hundreds of bouncing bulbs, aggressively bouncing around and occasionally colliding with him with full force. Immobilus totalis. With a wand wave, the bulbs aiming for Adam's apple suddenly froze in mid-air. Oh, who's this? Oh, it's you, Rachel, Merlin save you. I fear these things would have beaten me to death if it weren't for you. Ray rose from the ground, shaking off dirt, and thanked Rachel. Ray, where's your wand? And how did this happen? I don't know why, but when I was transplanting these little devils, they went berserk. First thing, they knocked my wand out, and when I tried to pick it up, they started hitting me on the hands. Then, they even got my eye. Rachel nodded, suppressing a smile. Why suppress a smile? Well, when Ray lifted his head, she saw his panda eyes. Hee <laughs> hee. When Ray found his wand, he quickly cast several cleansing and healing spells on himself, but the panda eyes remained. Let me help. Oh, thank you. Rachel pointed her wand at Ray. Vulnera Sainanter. But before Rachel could finish, a scream came from behind her. Ah. Robbery, robbery. They're killing. Five minutes ago, Elena had gone to buy milk from the neighbor. When she returned, a scene unfolded before her. A woman in a not-so-clean black coat aimed her wand at her husband, who already had a battered face and two enormous black eyes. Elena. Rachel. Ray. Elena, this is Rachel. I was attacked by bulbs. Over the next five minutes, Ray explained to Elena that everything was okay, and Rachel hadn't turned to the dark side. At 11 a.m., Rachel returned home. For nearly two hours, she had been checking the quality of the bouncing bulbs Ray had grown. It was an important order for their village. Bouncing bulbs were used as an ingredient in a potion that turned heads into pumpkins. 
Rachel initially didn't understand why the city of Adastra ordered a massive batch of bulbs from their village until someone explained the potion aspect. In essence, based on internal information, someone from the council wanted to organize a carnival in the city for Halloween, and these potions would be distributed free to children on behalf of the wizard council. Now, four out of fifteen farmers in the region were growing bouncing bulbs, and they paid well. However, the requirements for the vegetable were high to ensure the maximum duration of the potion's effect. As the responsible person for the region, Rachel had the right to be one of the evaluators of the produce. Though her opinion wasn't decisive for the sake of impartiality, she was the one who requested an inspector to visit the village and pay for the produce. If the results were satisfactory, the region would gain exclusive rights to grow jumping bulbs for Halloween, translating to a substantial amount of money for the village's development from the council. In short, it was crucial. Fortunately, Ray's batch was doing well, the bulbs hadn't fully ripened, but they were already quite active, or perhaps aggressive. However, this was a sign of quality for this type of plant. So, when Rachel returned home, she was pleased. Unfortunately, her happy mood didn't last long. Rachel grabbed a snack, lit a fire in the fireplace, which also served as a grill, and went upstairs to her bedroom to change. As she entered the bedroom, a voice immediately irritated her. Oh, Merlin, what a dreadful choice of clothing. I suggest you walk with a bag over your head, so people won't see how a beautiful lady wears this trash. These insults came from the talking mirror. Rachel doesn't know why, but a week ago, she decided to buy this mirror, fashion advisor. Who knew it had such a filthy mouth? There are only two outfits that this alchemical creation likes, and nothing else. Every time she dresses in her farmer's clothes, a torrent of condemnation pours down on her. Believe it or not, but if you call my work clothes trash one more time, I'll take you to an XXXL fashion show. Oh, Merlin. You devil. This is an abuse of mirrors. Rachel was glad the threat worked because the mirror now not only didn't say a word but also trembled a bit. Chapter 98, The Magical World Through Rachel's Eyes, Part 2 Radiant in her choice, Rachel selected an outfit that suited her. Leaving a set consisting of a white sleeveless shirt and dark blue wide trousers on the bed, she headed to the bathroom. Deciding it was better to freshen up before departure, especially after spending a couple of hours reviewing and checking the quality of her jumping bow. At 12.20, Rachel was already seated at the table, with a plate of delicious bolognese she had prepared the day before in front of her. After eating and enjoying an hour, she glanced at the clock. 12.50. With the help of spells, she quickly tidied up the kitchen. Seven minutes left until departure. Rachel took the ticket slash port key on the windowsill and sat down to tie her shoelaces at the entrance. After finishing, she opened the door, grabbed a small bag hanging to the right of the door, and stepped out with the ticket in her hand. Locking the door, she began to wait. If everything is correct, the port key should activate in a minute. Rachel calmly waited as the ticket would transport her to the exhibition. The wait wasn't long, within a couple of minutes. She was already standing in the teleportation hall number 6 of the Hog's Head Inn, with only a short dizziness as a consequence. Coming to her senses, Rachel looked around and headed towards the exit. Passing through several halls of departure, reception, and waiting, she reached the front desk of the Hog's Head Inn. Good day, could you please tell me where the entrance to the exhibition is? Good day, you need to head to the north entrance of the hotel, and you'll find your way from there. But the exhibition opens at 1400 hours you're early. Other visitors haven't even arrived yet. Oh, I think that explains it. Rachel placed the exhibition ticket on the table. When the girl behind the counter saw the ticket, she immediately picked it up. Ah, so you're the regional head. Here's your room key, room 112. Now, I need to record your ticket number. Done. You can check in, all expenses and the minibar are covered by the Wizards Council. The buffet is available from 10 o'clock to 1500 hours and 1900 hours to 2300 hours. But don't worry, the restaurant operates 24 sevenths, you just have to order. Have a great day. Oh, wait, I almost forgot, I received this information just an hour ago. All region heads can enter at 1330, half an hour earlier than other visitors. Thank you for letting me know. Goodbye. Rachel didn't bother putting her things in the hotel room there was no need. She had her bag and ticket, nothing more. In the bag, of course, were a few spare outfits, but why bother taking them out when she had a magically expanded bag? In short, 
Rachel headed straight for the entrance called the North Gates. Passing through several bars and meeting rooms, Rachel saw the large exhibition center. There was already a queue at the entrance to the exhibition. Interestingly, the line was divided into two lanes. Approaching the aura responsible for maintaining order, Rachel asked while showing her ticket. Excuse me, which of the two lines is designated for visitors from the regions? The right one. You're just in time, they'll start letting you in in ten minutes. Thank you. Rachel thanked Aura and joined the right queue. As Aura had mentioned, approximately ten minutes later, the guards began letting people in from the right line, checking their tickets. Once Rachel entered the hall, representatives from nearby booths immediately surrounded her. Good day, miss. Would you like to see our latest soil cultivator adapted for two types of traction? It can be powered either by magic or a thestral. Special reins are included. Our company also breeds thestrals. Madam, I think you'd be interested in our seed planter. Through alchemy, seeds receive their first dose of water immediately upon planting. Ma'am, take a look at this irrigation system. It utilizes miniaturized portals. Just leave one portal gate in the nearest river, and it will continuously supply water to your crops. Automatic axes. No need to use magic on them anymore, just flip the switch. Zero mana consumption for the wizard fully powered by external mana. Alchemical birthing doll, assists domestic animals during childbirth. Works for everything from regular cows to pegasi. Organic root remover potion. No harm to the soil. Turns annoying roots from the previous plant into fertilizer. No need for heavy machinery. Just mix 100 grams of the potion with 10 liters of water and spray it over the area where you need to get rid of roots. We offer pest control services a new company founded by garden gnomes. Will quickly and efficiently eliminate moles and may beetle larvae. Potion of accelerated growth, a new generation. 10% more effective. A French company offers a new alchemical air blower. Be cautious with the modes. There are three of them. From the standard level to one that not only blows leaves but also your entire house. Stabilization is achieved through immobilus magic, you simply direct and fix the air blower in space, gradually moving it. Alchemical Lawnmower No need to clear the remains of grass on your plot, in the collection compartment for mowed grass, there's an activated portal that sends the grass you've mowed directly to the hangar for drying. Rachel constantly heard names of various items but couldn't decide what to look at first, she stood in confusion at the crossroads. Noticing that a few people seemed lost or unsure where to go, a girl with brochures approached Rachel and two others who seemed just as lost. Good day, I noticed you look lost. Here. This is the exhibition map. Input your magical energy, and it will guide you to the selected booth. If you have any more questions, please contact the information desk in the center of the exhibition, it's marked on the map with an eye sign. The girl handed each of them a brochure and left. Rachel looked at the thin, folded brochure and, unfolding it, saw the map of the exhibition hall. It had numbers for each booth and the products they offer. Somewhere on the map, a red dot had shifted. That was her current location. Reading the map, Rachel identified two booths that interested her. Having decided where to go, she promptly headed in that direction. Comment. 7. Comment. Vote. Chapter 99, Chapter 99, The Magical World Through Rachel's Eyes Part 3. I need a batch of your potion, estimate how much would be needed for 20 hectares. Rachel stood before one of the stalls, notebook in hand, jotting something down. 20 hectares. I'd recommend 300 liters. Of course, if you want to maintain the optimal concentration of active elements in the solution. So, 1 liter for 6 square meters. Yes, assuming the right ratio of potion to water. It's not a problem if you have a bit too much potion, but if the fertilizers are too little compared to the water. Yes, yes, efficiency will suffer. I understand. All right, I'll go apply for funding. I'll be back as soon as possible. All right. Rachel nodded to the seller and headed towards the development financing desk nearby. After some time, weaving through the crowd and waiting in line for a few minutes, Rachel finally reached the cashier. Good day, how can I assist you? Good day, from District 102, England, Rachel Thorbles wishes to request funding for three items showcased at the exhibition. All right, have you filled out the application form? Yes, fortunately. Each seller has several of them. Rachel said, handing over two completed forms. All right, 
Soil Improvement Potion, and you're the first customer to approach the garden gnomes, and new watering gates. Can you justify your requests? Our village recently received an exclusive order for cultivating jumping bulbs, and to maintain quality production, I believe it's necessary to use the very best fertilizers. As for the garden gnomes, this request is directly related to my third inquiry. As you've seen, I want funding to purchase watering gates. The issue is that while the gates can transport water, they are too expensive. I'd like to request funding for a trial sample, and the garden gnomes should lay a stream to the other farms in the village. Hmm. The woman behind the desk pondered for a moment, but after a while. All right, although I think it's more practical to request multiple portal irrigation systems at once, it's your choice. Provide your council member identification and wait for two minutes. Here you go. Rachel handed the woman something like a token, a hexagonal token with the number 102 engraved on it. The woman took the token and moved back a bit, sitting at another desk to fill out some paperwork. After half an hour, Rachel held three documents in her hands and walked towards the stands she had previously chosen. Approaching the familiar man selling potions, she said. Here's the confirmation of funding receipt. After providing the service, you'll receive payment directly at the Ad Astra Bank. The happy man took the paper with a magical seal on it. Excellent, excellent. To which address should we ship the potions? To City Warehouse Number 102, we'll distribute the potions among the residents ourselves. Thank you. No, thank you. You can't imagine how delighted I am. Before the magical surge, I was just an unknown potion maker, but now authorities come to me and order potions. Um, okay. Rachel soon left the excited man and headed to the next booth. Underscore 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 Two days later. Rachel stood by the river, as if waiting for someone. Swoosh, swoosh. Two consecutive apparition sounds, and behind Rachel appeared three, two and a half people. Good morning. Miss Thorbles, is this the river where we're installing the portal irrigation system? Good morning, yes. All right, I see you have other visitors besides me, so let's get to work right away. Rachel nodded and glanced at the man who had already taken out a large suitcase of tools from his pocket. Miss Thorbles, do we need to extend this river to other farms? Yes, try to make branches without interfering with the portal installation. Got it. One man and one garden gnome exclaimed loudly. Hey, Ramsey, go call the others. I'll check the soil for now. The garden gnome said and dove into the ground like into a pool. When Rachel thought she was about to witness a linguistic nose, the gnome simply disappeared into the earth. The man also wanted to apparate to bring the other garden gnomes when Rachel asked. Um, are you the founder of the company? Hey? Oh, is it strange to see garden gnomes and humans working together? I'm a co-founder, Flubus is also a co-founder. There are three of us are owners, and fifteen workers, all except me, are garden gnomes. Don't take it as rudeness, I'm not a racist. It's just interesting how this happened. A wizard started a company with garden gnomes and even considers them equals. Many ask me about this. These guys were actually my only friends after the Death Eater attack fifteen years ago. My wife and son died, and I was left alone in the house, not knowing how to go on. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No. It's okay. Well, one day I wanted to end it all by hanging myself, but out of nowhere, Flubus popped up and cut the rope. He called me an idiot and all that. Sorry, I need to call the others. Um, yes, yes. Sorry again for making you remember. The man just nodded and operat. Chapter 100, folks, this is the hundredth chapter. Hooray. Hooray, hooray. Slash conversation with preemies. While Rachel and much of the world were discussing and applying the new inventions from the MIPE exhibition, Magic Inventions and Potions Expo, Asmodeus sat in his office with closed eyes, seemingly immersed in thought. He closed his eyes as he contemplated. A day ago, he received a message from the system, with the following content. Ding, request to the host for communication. Please confirm connection within three days. Asmodeus had long wanted to understand where the system came from and why it was helping him. But when the chance presented itself, he hesitated a little. What kind of being stands behind the system? Exhaling, 
he still decided to accept the invitation. Confirm connection. Asmodeus felt his consciousness being drawn somewhere and did not resist. When he felt the environment change, he opened his eyes. Before him was a dark space. Or rather, space. Under his feet, he saw something resembling a planet, but it was definitely not Earth, with at least ten extra continents. This is what I looked like before. A voice came from the void. Hey. I'm here. Asmodeus turned around and saw something like a cluster of light or energy before him. The cluster was small, smaller than a football. You? The system. Yes and no. I am Premies, the will of this world, which has awakened again thanks to you. While Premies spoke, the light of her body, or what could be called a body, flickered. Me? Yes. The system is what I created as a last resort. Our world was losing in the war with that dimension and the four gods. I tried with all my might to break free and escape from that universe, although I successfully detached, it led to my current state. Ha, a pitiful ball with seven continents. Fortunately, before losing consciousness, I separated part of my will, with the sole purpose of finding someone to restore the world, at least to the minimum necessary level for me to awaken again. So, you're the accumulation of all the thoughts of the planet's inhabitants? Then why does the system aim to strengthen the planet's population instead of increasing it, for example? As a result of the forced separation from the original universe, I lost access to many energies. Only those that certain organisms living on me and I myself can generate remained. But for maintaining the consciousness of the world, the number of its inhabitants doesn't matter, only strong individuals are important. So, the stronger a person is, the stronger their thoughts that shape you. In a sense. Wait, then why didn't you just empower everyone with magic? You gave me runes that turned non-magical folks into wizards. That's a requirement I embedded in my fragment. Only a truly outstanding individual can be chosen. Your lineage, it's very potent. Your arrival in this world gave me more energy than hundreds of thousands of beings. Though I don't know why your blood is sealed, it doesn't change the essence of it. From my perspective, when you appeared in the world, it was like a bright star in a starless sky. You didn't answer why you didn't give magic directly to people. Such power is not considered natural. It's external, effectively produced by me. Muggles, as you call them. Even after being influenced by mana, they are not exactly the same as Verumis, although it increases the chance of Verumis appearing, and Muggles will start producing energy after some time. A greater number of such beings still cannot help me enough. If I may illustrate, if you stand among hundreds of thousands of as he called you, Verumis, one Verumis is worth a thousand Muggles, who didn't get magic rings. Verumis, you and I, create this energy. We share a common root. The more people know about this energy, the more it can manifest in them and in me. But I couldn't just give power to weak beings. For Verumis, it was too risky. If the so-called muggles turned this power against Verumis. If Verumis became even fewer than a couple of hundred years ago, I would be forever forgotten. That's why I actively helped various Verumis create spells that would help them hide from muggles, waiting for someone who could exactly fulfill what is needed. Verumis? And he. It's too early for you to know. Okay. You said I radiate more energy, but I'm not from this world. It doesn't matter. Those whom you brought from another universe. They also radiate more energy, especially the one-eyed one. He's no weaker than you. Although your powers are sealed. Sealed by whom? I don't know. But I see that this seal is not created to harm. When you become strong enough, it will gradually fade. And in making you stronger, I can help with that. So. You chose me for this? We're mutually beneficial. In a certain sense, yes. All right, then why did you summon me? Not just for a chat. I wanted to tell you that you must prepare. For what? I found certain parts of myself that separated during the transition to this universe. The continents that are missing. Yes, at least some of them. And then? I have to consume them and return them to their places. Why am I here for that? These separated pieces also developed their own wills. They don't want to be consumed, though they are too weak to compete with me. Well, the important thing is that when I consume the remaining wills, the continents will return to their original places. And that could harm Verumis. Also, I don't know what creatures are currently living in those worlds. In those? Not just one. Two, they are close to each other, 
so I track them. What will happen when the continents return? Earthquakes? Or something like that. It will shake a bit, but I'll hold it. Your goal is to be ready to confront the forces of other parts. Although I don't think there will be two strong opponents there. But certain Verumis might have become something like gods there. Gods. Is this again something I don't need to know? You're kidding me? Say at least something. The only thing I can tell you is that the path they chose is wrong. The path to becoming a true god does not lie through faith. Okay, it's time for you to leave. What? Wayayat. Asmodeus felt himself being pushed out of the strange space. Asmodeus woke up, still sitting in his office. I swear to become like Rick Sanchez and the planet. Asmodeus shouted to himself. Knock, knock. Asmodeus, I've prepared dinner. I'm waiting for you downstairs. Rovina's voice came from behind the door. Asmodeus calmed down and was about to go downstairs to have dinner when the system panel appeared before his eyes. Ding, countdown started, 30 days. So, a month. Well, so be it. Extinguishing the lamp, Asmodeus went downstairs to have dinner. Thanks for listening. <laughs>